President Biden's, Biden's weaknesses have not only shattered our national security, it has shattered global security. From the disastrous retreat in Afghanistan to an unprecedented attack on our greatest ally, the President's weakness has created a state of affairs that was unthinkable just a few short years ago. America and our partners deserve far better. House Republicans have warned President Biden time and time again of a simple truth. Weakness invites aggression. He obviously did not listen. But don't take my word for it. Take the word of President Obama's former Secretary of Defense and President Bush's former Secretary of Defense, Secretary Gates, where he said, Brock, uh, Joe Biden has been wrong on nearly every major foreign policy and national security issue over the past four decades. End quote. Nevertheless, we are stepping up and delivering critical aid to our allies in a world destabilized by this failed leadership. Today, the Rules Committee will consider several bills designed to aid Israel, Taiwan, and Ukraine as they each face grave threats to their very existence. They're in these dangerous situations, not in spite of President Biden's leadership, but because of it. H.R. 8034, the Israeli Se Israel Security Supplemental Appropriations Act, will provide much-needed material support to the Jewish state as it faces twin threats from Hamas and the Islamic Republic of Iran. For decades, America's ironclad support for Israel always formed the foundation of their security. President Biden dismantled that foundation through his continued efforts to appease his radical base at their expense. What's more, his financial appeasement of Iran has added fuel to the fire. For example, his administration reissued a sanctions waiver and renewed it again last month that gave Iran access to more than $10 billion. It certainly didn't make it harder for the world's largest state sponsor of terrorism to wage a campaign of violence. H.R. 8034 delivers $26.38 billion to support Israel in its effort to defend itself against Iran and its proxies, and it reimburses the United States military for operations in response to recent, recent attacks. Notably, the legislation sets aside $4 billion to replenish Iron Dome and David Sling missile defense systems. Israel desperately needs, needs this aid now. Isn't, Iran wasn't the only one taking note of President Biden's weaknesses. China is happy to watch the United States abandon our place of leadership and has undoubtedly placed Taiwan in its crosshairs because of this. We cannot stand by as the likelihood of another authoritarian adversary invading a neighbor increases on this president's watch. H.R. 8036, the Indo-Pacific Security Supplemental Appropriations Act, provides over $8 billion to continued efforts to counter communist China and ensure a strong deterrence in the region. Within that figure, $3.3 billion is appropriated for submarine infrastructure and $2 billion for the foreign military financing program. We cannot afford to wake up in a world where we are too late to come to Taiwan's aid. Ukraine is another flashpoint in Biden's broken world order. Before Vladimir Putin's brutal invasion, the president recklessly signaled that he would accept a, quote, minor incursion, close quote. Ukrainians pay for that horrific step each and every day. H.R. 8035, the Ukraine Security Supplemental Appropriations Act, provides for critical funding while also safeguarding American contributions. The bill supplies $13.8 billion for procurement of advanced weapon systems, defense articles, and defense services, it also appropriates over $23 billion to replenish defense articles and services provided to Ukraine. Finally, the Rules Committee will also consider H.R. 8038, the 21st Century Peace Through Strength Act. This last item will bolster the tools we have available to respond to the evolving threats in President Biden's dangerous new reality. As always, I know I can look forward to a fulsome and robust debate on the pressing issues that are facing this nation, um, I'll, you know, I'm happy to yield to our ranking member, to Mr. McGovern, for any comments he wishes to make. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, all I can say after hearing your opening statement is, wow, um, you guys never miss an opportunity 
to blame your own incompetence on Joe Biden. I mean, uh, you blame Joe Biden for everything. Uh, I'm surprised you didn't blame him for the earthquake uh, in your opening remarks. Um, you don't blame Iran. You don't blame any of the bad players, but everything is blamed on Joe Biden. I guess that's the Republican talking points. But uh, it is unbelievable to me that it has taken this long for the, this Republican majority to do their job. Uh, the incompetence and the indifference is stunning. I mean, I, I really can't believe it. Uh, I don't expect much of this Republican majority, uh, but uh, this is uh, really beyond the pale. You know, the Senate found common ground months ago, and meanwhile the world has been watching, and our allies have been waiting and waiting and waiting for the GOP to get their act together. Well, guess what? Our allies are out of time, and the Republican Party is out of excuses. The Ukrainian people have suffered as a result of, the G of this GOP majority. Ukrainians are engaged in a brutal war, not of their own choosing, a brutal war against an expansionist Russia at the hands of Vladimir Putin, who wants to rebuild the old Soviet Union. Mark my words, he will not stop at Ukraine. And I'm telling you right now, if we do not help Ukraine fight for their democracy uh, and fight to protect their sovereignty, this war will not end. It will grow. It will grow. And this Republican delay has helped Putin and hurt Ukraine. And maybe that's what the intent is. But if that's the, uh, if that's the purpose of all of this, it really is horrific. So again, I want to congratulate my Republican colleagues for finally realizing the gravity of the situation and the urgency with which we must act. This is the right thing to do, but it's also what this country wants. Six in ten Americans favor providing both economic assistance to Ukraine and sending additional arms and military supplies to the U Ukrainian government, according to Ipsos. CB CBS even reports that, uh, that, a, that a huge number of Republicans want to help Ukraine, because they know if Ukraine fit, falls, Putin will not stop there. He will not. He will keep going until he drags all of Europe into his vicious war. And I hope that my colleagues across the aisle understand that is what is at stake here. And I am hopeful that now we can come to the table, tune out the extremism, and do what our constituents want us to do. That is why uh, we are sent here uh, to compromise, to work in divided government, to get things done. You know, compromise is not a dirty word. Uh, it's our job, especially in divided government. And I hope that my friends use this moment as a time to reflect on how their majority is going, because it's time for them to stop following the MAGA extremists off a cliff. And it's time for all of us to make sure that our al allies get the aid that they need. <coughs> I mean, this is, this, mo this is a moment of urgency. This is a time for us to act. And it, it may even be too late. Uh, I hope it's not. But I hope that we will act. I hope we will act decisively and quickly. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Chair, thanks the gentleman for his remarks. Without objection, any prepared statements that our witnesses have will be included in the record. I would like to welcome our first panel, uh, no stranger to this committee, Chairman Tom Cole on the Appropriations Committee, former chairman of the Rules Committee. Mr. Cole, we're, we're grateful to have you back. Ranking member Rosa DeLauro, also from the Committee on Appropriations. Chairman Mike McCall and ranking member Meats from the Committee on Foreign Affairs. Chairman Cole, again, welcome back to the committee. I can't tell you how badly we miss you, uh, but, <laughs> but you are now recognized and I welcome your testimony. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I know you miss me. I don't think anybody else does, uh, but uh, it's a delight to be back here. Uh, Chairman Burgess, Ranking Member McGovern, distinguished members of the Rules Committee, I want to thank uh, you for your warm welcome. When I cycled off the Rules Committee last week, I knew I'd be back in this room at, uh, and at this witness table at some point. I did not anticipate it would be quite this soon. Uh, but as we've all seen, events move at their own speed in the House of Representatives. I come before you today to testify on a series of critical security supplemental bills that provide much-needed defense assistance to our allies and partners around the world. 
We're confronting a tinderbox of uh, uninvited aggression on multiple fronts, and America must stand firmly on the side of freedom. Peace through strength cannot be delivered through appeasement. Taken together, these measures protect our friends and partners and replenish <clears throat> American stockpiles of ammunition, weapons, and supplies. This is not only uh, about safeguarding I the ideals of democracy and peace, but also central to our own national security. The tyrants and dictators at the helm of Russia, China, and Iran show disdain for sovereignty, and they are acting on it. Uh, we are here because uh, the shared order of the free world is at risk. It's not hypothetical, and that's not uh, hyperbolic uh, rhetoric. Two years ago, Vladimir Putin launched a forcible and illegal invasion of Ukraine. The onslaught was brutal, yet the defiant Ukrainian people have fought valiantly. They refused to let Moscow take their homeland, but the conflict is now a war of attrition. It's incumbent on Ukraine's friends to provide needed aid so that Ukraine can continue to resist. Israel, too, is literally on the front lines. Last year, Hamas launched a vicious terror attack on our great ally. 1,200 Israelis were murdered and hundreds of people taken captive. 130 hostages, including American citizens, remain imprisoned in Gaza today. Iran has taken note and is looking to prolong violence in the region. This past weekend, Tehran executed an unprecedented aerial assault on Israel, firing hundreds of missiles and drones. Both of these were intercepted by Israeli forces and those of Israel's friends and allies, including the United States. But the threat from this known state sponsor of terrorism cannot be understated. Nor can the threat from Iran's proxies, not just Hamas, but Hezbollah, the Houthis, and others, all of which are capable of and willing to commit themselves to warfare against Israel. Taiwan, meanwhile, faces real and serious threats from the Chinese Communist Party, which looks across the Taiwan Strait and into the South China Sea. Taiwan continues to show the world what a free and democratic China could look like, uh, and its security is critical to American security interests in the Asia-Pacific theater. We are at an inflection point, and I'd remind everyone here to remember history. We're living in what feels like a time in the past. In the 1930s, aggressor nations probed for weakness, seeking any openings to exploit their neighbors. At the time, the democratic West had opportunities to confront and end this aggression. We failed to do so. And from that failure, Nazi Germany, fascist Italy, and a militarized Japan took the message that uh, we could do and would do nothing to stop them. The result was a bloody and devastating, uh, you know, war accumulating in the largest and most destructive and deadliest war in history. The eyes of the world are upon us again today. Russia's watching, Iran is watching, the Chinese Communist Party is watching. And what are we going to show them? Failing to pass this critical national security aid is a gift to our adversaries. I would encourage all members to vote to support this critical legislation, and I want to thank again uh, this committee for your kind invitation to appear before you and to testify today. I look forward to your questions. Chair, thanks, the gentleman. The gentleman is back. Mr. Meeks, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ranking Member. You know, I wish we were not here. I believe the appropriate thing would have been months ago, we've just simply passed a bipartisan uh, supplemental that the Senate passed and sent over. Because the clock is going tick tock on our allies. We need to get them what they need immediately. Ukraine is on the brink. They need this supplemental and what's contained therein. And in fact, they needed it months ago. The camera of history is rolling. And it's watching what we're doing at this time. This is a critical time in the history of the United States of America and our allies all around the world. The quickest way to get them what they need would have been to pass the Senate supplemental bill. It would be signed today. 
and the ammunition needed by our Ukrainian allies, our Israel allies, our friends in the Indo-Pacific, and the humanitarian aid that is desperately needed in Gaza and around the world would be out. But here we are. And I have to say that this has been an utterly chaotic process the past 72 hours to put together a so-called side cost supplemental package. And I'm very disappointed that every component bill in the foreign affairs section of this legislation was sponsored by the majority. That is not the appropriate way to craft bipartisan legislation. Democrats have a tremendous number of good ideas on how to strengthen our sanctions and impose costs on bad actors and human rights violators around the world. Yet those views are currently not reflected in this bill. That said, context is important. And the context is this. The Ukrainian army and the Ukrainian people have shown tremendous bravery and astounding courage to resist the invasion of their nation by Putin's forces. They have the will to fight. They've shown that for over two years. They have the ability to fight and win. They have also shown that. We just need to give them what they need. They need the weapons to do so. And right now, they are running out of everything from defensive missiles to basic ammunition. We need to get them aid. And in the Middle East, our ally Israel just faced an unprecedented onslaught from Iran. We need to have their backs. And for the people facing humanitarian crises, it would simply be against my values not to support individuals facing deprivation and starvation. We need to act to prevent a famine. Given this context, I will support H.R. 8038, the 21st Century Peace Through Strength Act. This is not a bill that I would have drafted. All of the legislation in my jurisdiction was sponsored, as I said, by the majority. The process of putting this package together has been quite frustrating. One bill which was never negotiated, and I still do not know how it ended up in the package, includes a new sanctions authority without a waiver. But for the most part, the collection of legislation included in the sidecar is bipartisan, and the Republicans were willing to make at least some notable changes to improve the legislation. On repo, pertaining to the seizure of Russian sovereign assets, there is no doubt that Russia should pay for its crimes against humanity in Ukraine. As Vice President Harris termed it, this bill importantly irons out legal questions and make sure that the United States does not act alone, but rather in a coordinated fashion with our G7 partners. And there are an array of Middle East sanction bills included in this package, including several we voted on this week. Importantly also, the majority agreed to add a humanitarian exception in three of the bills that I had long been requesting. I hope that going forward we can make including these exceptions as a matter of course rather than last <clears throat> second negotiations. But I do want to thank my friend and the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee, Mr. McCall, and his team for the good faith negotiations on the Middle East section of the legislation, including the incorporation of certain exceptions and carve-outs that I believe will bolster our moral credibility without undermining our toughness. As is the policy on our committee, Mr. McCall and I do try to work together in a bipartisan way, and I appreciate working with him. The legislation also contains several bills in the financial services and energy and commerce lanes. Important changes were made to these bills. And while I voted against H.R. 7520 on the floor, as I am concerned, it is a blank check authorization that could go far beyond what people in Washington are talking about. I think the bill at least took a step in the right direction with a more realistic time frame for a complex divestiture process. And again, 
I would point to the context of the moment. I have been saying for months, we need to support our friends and allies around the world now. This was not idle talk. It was not political talk. It was a fact. We need to support Ukraine immediately. We need to fund humanitarian aid. We need to back Israel and Taiwan and cannot let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And therefore, I support this legislation and hope I can continue to do so if amendments are made to this bill. And I yield back. General yields back, Chair. Thanks, gentlemen. Chair McCall, my apologies. I should have gone to you as chairman first. That's right. um, but you're, now you're recognized. We'll take it as a, a rookie mistake. We'll, uh, <laughs> we're anxious to hear what you bring to us. And, and Chairman Burgess, it's great to say that. And congratulations on your chairmanship. Ranking Member McGovern, um, you know, this is a critical time in history. I think this is, in my 20 years in Congress, uh, we are at a real pivotal point in history as we look at the map and our adversaries. I remember Mr. Meeks and I going to Poland to see the refugees fleeing out of Ukraine. And he could have taken a black and white photo and it would have looked like 1939. And that's exactly what the polls told us was, this is 1939 all over again. And um, after the fall of Afghanistan, we saw the Russian Federation satellite imagery moving towards Ukraine. We knew it was gonna happen, we warned them, and it happened. And prior to that, Chairman Xi at the Olympics met with Putin. They're allies. And Chairman Xi is watching what happens in Ukraine to determine whether he invades Taiwan in the Pacific. And then the Ayatollah now has raised his ugly head. The, these dictators, including North Korea, are all tied together. And the idea that we can separate then we don't pick and choose our enemies. Uh, they choose us. And this bill is probably one of the most important votes we'll have in our careers uh, because it does confront all of those threats. And we saw last Saturday, you know, rockets coming in from Iran for the first time in history, out of Iran into Israel itself. Over 300 of them, fortunately 99% were shot down because we have provided them with the necessary air defenses. But looking at Ukraine, it is a dire situation. I talked to the ambassador yesterday. Kharkiv is on the verge of collapse, second largest city in, in, in uh, Ukraine, and the power grid could go out uh, any day. Time is not on our side, and I'm glad we are finally here to discuss this. Now, and also, as I look at Chairman Xi's intentions in Taiwan, and the threats that I personally received when I visited that island, surrounded by battleships and aircraft carriers and threats, uh, their intention is very clear. And what happens in Ukraine, as the Japanese ambassador or prime minister said at this his joint session, what happens in Ukraine affects Taiwan. So we're at that moment, and it's a time for choosing, as Reagan said. And I think the choice is, do you want to be Churchill or do you want to be Chamberlain? I want to thank the speaker. The speaker's had a lot of pressure on him. Very difficult circumstance. And I was with him the night before he made his decision. And I know he, he takes it very uh, personally. And he is a man of faith. And I think he um, doesn't wear it on his sleeve. But I think he got down on his knees. And he, he prayed for guidance and said, look, tell me, what is the right thing to do here? And then he told me the next day, I want to be on the right side of history. I want to be on the right side of history. And I think he is following the legacy of Churchill. He's choosing to confront the generational threat posed by this unholy alliance of Russia, China, and Iran. As Reagan said, a time for choose, in his time for choosing speech, I believe that the issues confronting us cross party lines. As chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee, I believe that partisanship stops at the watershed's edge. In fact, after uh, October 7th, we were crafting a resolution, and some would say, oh, we need to make that a partisan resolution. Mr. Meeks and I disagree with that. We need to speak as one, with one voice, as one nation, more addressing particularly our adversaries. They need to know that we're not divided as a nation. We have dissent in democracy, and that's, that's a democracy, but in matters of this, we need to be unified. 
And that's why I'm proud to support the 21st Century Peace Through Strength Act, which is largely made up of House-passed bipartisan bills. Uh, I want to thank Mr. Meeks for his contributions. Um, it provides a critical security assistance to our partners and uh, makes great policy changes so we can better defeat opponents of freedom and democracy. It also includes my bipartisan bicameral repo act that calls upon the Biden administration to transfer frozen Russian sovereign assets in the United States to Ukraine for reconstruction and other purposes like direct budget support. It's a narrow targeted piece of legislation that ensures that Russia pays for the war it started, that Russia pays for its war crimes. Putin's war crimes and genocide cannot be reversed by money, however. The horrors, the, the pictures we've seen, murdered civilians, including women and children, and a maternity hospital bombed cannot be brought back, and the trauma will live on in that country for generations. And we have a moral responsibility. There's human suffering. Critical infrastructure, homes, and towns can be rebuilt, though. And making Russia pay for that is not just the morally and strategically right thing to do. It's also fiscally responsible on behalf of our constituents. Let them pay for it rather than the American taxpayer. Putin caused this devastation, and Putin, he can pay for it. This act ensures Americans, especially our children, will be protected from the malign influence of the CCP-controlled TikTok. This app silently gathers Americans' personal data in their pockets. It manipulates its users, allowing the CCP censors to dictate the contents its users see. TikTok is modern-day Trojan horse of the CCP to surveil and exploit America's personal information. This legislation is the first step in protecting Americans against foreign subversive data collection. And I'd like to thank Ranking Member Pallone for this contribution. It also targets illicit fentanyl supply chain, from the chemical suppliers in China to the cartels that traffic the drugs in from Mexico. Synthetic opioids, primarily fentanyl, killed more than 100,000 Americans last year alone, over 200,000 since this administration. That's more than World War II and Vietnam combined. And it's time for this to end. My bill also includes the most comprehensive sanctions against Iran that Congress has passed in years, including the SHIP Act that imposes sanctions on foreign ports, vessels, or refineries who deal in Iranian oil. Imagine this, Mr. Chairman. $80 billion of energy has been exported from Iran, bought by China, that they use to fund their terror operations that we saw last weekend. We need to stop that. Also, the Hamas International Financing Prevention Act imposes sanctions against Hamas, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, and other terrorist organizations. More importantly, my, my Crime Act imposes sanctions on anyone involved in the supply, sale, or transfer of Iran's missiles and drones. Think about this, Mr. Chairman. Iran makes the drones and the missiles that are bought by Russia to kill Ukrainians. They're, they're manufactured in Iran to kill Israelis. They're given to their proxies, and they're given to Russia. Again, this is all tied together. That act alone will stop the export of, the, of these Iranian drones and rockets and missiles that we saw last Saturday night in Israel and it'll stop it from happening in Ukraine as well. This will codify export control restrictions to limit Iran's ability to access U.S. technology to manufacture these missiles and drones. It's hard for me to even say that, that we're exporting technology from this country that Iran uses to make this stuff. And we do the same thing with China. But our adversaries are working together to undermine our Western values and to meet our democracy. In closing, I'm going to quote Reagan. I'm a 
Reagan Republican, I admired him, when he said, you know, evil is powerless if good are unafraid. We cannot be afraid at this moment. We have to do what's right, and we have to show strength. And peace through strength is what he taught us. Evil is on the march. History is calling, and now is the time to act. I yield back. The gentleman yields back to thank you for your testimony. Uh, Ranking Member Delora, you're recognized for your testimony. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and let me congratulate you on, on, on your chairmanship here. And I see that uh, the chair of the Appropriations Committee is back, and I, and I uh, congratulate uh, Chairman Cole as well. Uh, we have been on this side of the, uh, of the dais for a number of occasions and look forward to our working together. I want to acknowledge Ranking Member McGovern and the distinguished members of this committee. I strongly support passage of the three supplemental appropriations bills in this national security funding package. This legislation provides the support for our allies that has been desperately needed for months. It supports Ukraine against Russian aggression, Israel in its war against Iran and its proxies like Hamas, Hezbollah, and the Houthis our Indo-Pacific partners against an adversarial China, and it provides the urgently needed humanitarian aid for millions of civilians who have been caught in the crossfire across these theaters. Innocent families are in danger, children are starving, and civilian casualties are mounting in conflict zones all around the world. The humanitarian support in this bill would make sure that we are not leaving the Gazans, the Ukrainians, the Sudanese, the Haitians, the Rohingya behind. The Speaker has come out in support of aid to Ukraine. He said, and I quote, history judges us for what we do. This is a critical time in the world stage. And the Speaker continued, and I quote, I would rather send bullets to Ukraine than American boys. I applaud Speaker Johnson for taking a stand. He is right. History will judge us for whether we stand strong or we capitulate in this moment. The moment has met us. To my colleagues on the other side of the aisle who do not support this aid, we cannot retreat from the world stage under the guise of putting America first. We put America first by demonstrating the power of American leadership, that we have the strength and the resolve and the heart to fight for the most vulnerable people, to protect their freedom and preserve their dignity. It is shameful that the urgency of this moment has gone unanswered for so long. Our allies and our adversaries have seen America all but yield back its central role in defending human rights, freedom, and democracy. If Ukraine does not receive the support needed to counter Russia's outrageous attack on its sovereign territory, the legacy of this Congress will be, as been spoken by my colleagues here this morning, the appeasement of a dictator, the destruction of an allied nation, and a fractured Europe. And yes, my colleague, Congressman McCall has said, we can be either Neville Chamberlain or Winston Churchill. And I ask the members of this committee, what is the difference between drones, missiles, rockets raining down on Israel and drones, missiles, and rockets raining down on Ukraine? We will watch if we are not there for Ukraine. Gone will be the post-war order that has kept Europe free and prosperous. Gone will be our credibility in the eyes of our allies and our adversaries. And gone will be the America that promised to stand up for freedom, for democracy, for human rights, wherever they are threatened or wherever they are under attack. Vladimir Putin is betting that he can outlast the will and the determination of Ukraine, the United States, and other Western allies. We must prove him definitively wrong. An American general just last week quoted, and I, I, I quote, if you cannot fire back, 
you are losing. Ukraine is dangerously at the point where they cannot fire back. We cannot afford to allow them to lose. In the Middle East, I wholeheartedly support funding for Israel's defense. Israel was attacked by Iran, and I applaud the role of the United States and the role that it played to provide Israel in its defense against Iran and its proxies. And we are still awaiting Israel's response to the attack they experienced <coughs> over the weekend. We must ensure Israel can stand strong in the face of adversaries like Iran that seek its annihilation. We must also ensure that every step possible is taken to protect innocent life in Gaza and elsewhere. To that end, I have called for an immediate ceasefire of at least six weeks to facilitate the safe delivery of aid to civilians in Gaza. We must protect aid workers. We must open additional crossings to bring in at least 500 trucks a day and ensure that food is never used as a weapon of war. We need this time to help get hostages released. And the United States cannot sit by while people are starving to death. Our allies are facing existential threats, and our friends and our foes around the world are watching, waiting to see how America will respond. Putin is watching. G is watching. The Ayatollah Khomeini is watching. What course will America take? We cannot let any nation around the globe hold any doubt that the United States is a committed partner in the security of the free world. And we cannot shift the goalpost any further. And right now is the time to pass this bill. And I sit here this morning on this platform with colleagues, Democrats and Republicans, who are united in understanding that the moment has found us. We need to meet it, and we need to pass this legislation. I yield back. Chair, thank you, gentlelady. Thank all of our witnesses for their powerful testimony. Unfortunately, the whip scheduled a vote during the middle of all of this, so I'm going to yield to the vice chair of the committee, go vote, and I'll be back to join you on the other side. Mr. Thank, Rush, thanks, Chairman. I appreciate it. Uh, Chairman Cole? No, he went. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, okay, I'm I'm sorry, I was not here at the beginning. No, thank you. That's right, that's right. I have no question this time. Uh, ranking member, Governor? No, I, I just want to thank all of you for your testimony. And, um, and it seems like all of you are in agreement on how we should proceed. Uh, I appreciated the tone of all the testimonies. I think it was in contrast to the chairman's opening statement, uh, but I do appreciate your tone. Um, and I, I'm, I think we need to move this forward. So let's let's get on with it. And I would yield back my time. Thank you. I would yield back. Gentleman lady from Pennsylvania. Thank you. Um, I want to associate myself with the ranking member's remarks. In order to get to the hearing room today, we all had to run a gauntlet of our colleagues in the press with each of them asking, what is the Republicans' plan to pass any national security legislation? Does the majority even have the votes to pass this rule out of committee? Every week we've seen a new convoluted Rube Goldberg scheme from the leadership to placate the extremists in the House. <clears throat> and it's been clear for a long time now that many members of his party, of the Speaker's party, are not participating in the legislative process in good faith clear to everyone in this building and beyond that there's nothing the Speaker can do to get the votes of the extreme members of the Republican Party. There's no procedural gimmick. There's no amendment vote. There's no bipartisan secu border security bill or even a partisan immigration package that can win the votes of the chamber's right-wing members. It's time to stop negotiating with legislative terrorists and to work on behalf of the vast and bipartisan majority of the American people. We've wasted months dancing around the obvious solution here. Just pass the Senate supplemental. At any point over the past several months, we could have done that. 
under suspension of the rules. The Senate bill has broad bipartisan support in the House. The biggest losers in this game have been the American people, our national security, and that of democracies across the globe. So we're back in Rules Committee. No guarantee that Republicans can pass this rule, considering a convoluted package that's no different than the Senate supplemental that's downstairs in the hopper right now and could be called up at a moment's notice. <clears throat> quit the gimmicks, quit the games, pass the supplemental. I yield back. All right, thank you. My good friend from South Carolina. I want to thank the panelists for coming. I agree with what most of you said, to be honest with you. Uh, Mike, I agree. Chairman McCall, I agree with your assessment of the speaker. Um, we met, met with Speaker Johnson yesterday. Um, <clears throat> you know, I'm, I'm, it, it's amazing to me when you hear, look, she is watching uh, other leaders, but the American people are watching. Our only ask was to include a border bill. Our only ask was to include the border bill in this rule, not a, not a standalone, which the Senate will sit on, as they have H.R. 2. Give us something that, in, in the Senate uh, uh, so-called bipartisan bill, I don't call it bipartisan when you're letting five to 14,000 illegals per day in this country. That's not bipartisan. Um, Austin summed it up yesterday when I think he asked a number of you, how long are we going to do this? How long are we putting America last? The only linchpin leverage we have is funding for Ukraine. I feel for Ukraine. I feel for Israel. But I feel for the American people uh, in having this, this flood of illegals in this country <clears throat> that he's talking about on the brink. Uh, we saw the, and, and, and Chairman McCall, the vision of the refugees in Ukraine. I feel for them. But what about the vision of the illegals basically throwing, uh, pushing our Border Patrol agents down? What about the victims? How long are we going to have? How long are we going to have the picture of Lincoln Riley? How long are we going to have Kate Stiley, who was gunned down? Uh, how long are we going to put up with a 14-year-old girl in Campbell County, Virginia, who was brutally raped? How long are we going to put? Uh, are we going to stand by and let uh, the impersonator in Minneapolis, Minnesota, who went in and shot? He went in as a delivery man and shot three people in the head and in front of his two children. We're ignoring the main issue that the American people have said is keep our own border secure. Now, I've heard the argument that, well, the Senate won't buy it. Well, I'm sorry. If the Senate won't buy it, they won't get funding, is my opinion. They should not get funding for anything because America, our sovereignty is at stake here. That's why I'm voting no on this. Uh, I cannot sit back and let something that does not have the security of this country. Congressman Meeks, I cannot do it as we have an invasion at the border that affects everybody. It's an insult, and I think Austin mentioned it. It's an insult to those who have done it legally. Um, the president is, is totally responsible for this. It's under his watch over the last three and a half years that he's opened the borders up. And the, the not even putting the LNG requirement that we buy gas from America in here, if you really want to support uh, Israel and Ukraine, stop buying gas from OPEC countries that don't like us. It's not that complicated. So all, I'm, all we were, my reason, and it's tough to do this. It really is. But I'm simply not going, I cannot vote at any level. And I get it. We're going to probably pass it out of here. But it's, it's, it's something that I can't live with, and it's something that uh, the American people are screaming about. And anything moving forward, I would hope, would have some type of legislation that will shut the border down. And it's not uh, – hopefully it would be bipartisan to shut it down, but it's just not. There's one reason to, that they're having it in this power. Chairman McCall. If I, 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 I agree with everything you said. Um, and I live in a border state, and we're most impacted by it, and uh, the violence and the human trafficking. And, the, you know, we, I was an uh, impeachment manager for Mayorkas. Um, uh, you know, it, we have a president that is not willing to enforce the law. And we have a Senate that will not pass our bills. We passed H.R. 2. We're going to pass it again. Um, 
I kind of, this is more of an enforcement issue than it is legislative. And this is where elections have consequences because he has all the authorities that he needs. Remain in Mexico, I marked that up out of my committee, and it wasn't bipartisan. That was one of the few times, but it's a 30 year old statute. It's already, it, you know, he has the same authorities that President Trump had that he used successfully to get the border shut and secure, and this president is failing to do that. And so I would ask you not, and I get it, and I, and I wish the Senate would pass H.R. 2, but the reality is that they won't. But uh, I, would not, I would not jeopardize the future of democracy and the future of Israel and what's happening in Ukraine and, and in the Pacific, the greatest threat since my dad's war, World War II, threat to Europe and the Pacific. I would hope that you would not make that a, 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 a they're not mutually exclusive. Um, and so um, I would hope you consider that. But I totally agree with you uh, on what you're saying. Uh, we're stuck in this political situation. But I think at this point in time, the president has all the authorities he needs. He just won't enforce it. And I'll, uh, Chairman McCall, the only thing I would add to that, you put the only thing he understands is leverage. For some reason, the Senate has wanted this Ukraine funding for whatever reason. Uh, he, I can think of some. There's no need to, to, to mention yeah. why they want it or why they're getting 60 percent of the funds, which I would rather more the instead of the 26 million going to Israel far more. <clears throat> but that being said, it's, it's isn't that complicated. Defend America. Def, make make him do it or he doesn't get the money. Yeah. And that's 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 why I'll be voting against this. Now, I will close with this. I went to two funerals. Fentanyl yep. has killed two f in, in my hometown. 14-year-old yep. and 40. I mean, how long are we going to keep, keep this up? So, that's, yeah, my, I, my, been to, uh, my children have been to many. <clears throat> it's that's very, very sad. It's killed more than World War II and Vietnam. And, right. but um, thank you all for your testimony. I would say 80%, though, of the money for Ukraine does go into our defense industrial base. And it goes into uh, modernizing and replenishing our stockpiles in the United States. And it's going to create jobs in the United States. But that's vitally important, too, is we live in a far more dangerous world since this guy took office. Yep. Um, thank you. And uh, I yield back. Chair, sure, thanks. The gentleman, the gentleman yields back. The gentlelady from New Mexico is recognized. Thank you so very much. Um, you know, and I was struck as I was listening to the testimony of our witnesses, and I want to thank each of you for coming here. I also want to thank each of you um, for bringing to the committee and bringing to the American people, as well as the House membership, the unity of vision that you have presented to us today. Uh, the, the concept that we are in a moment where we must act, and we must act decisively, and it should be bipartisan. Uh, thank you very much. Chairman Cole and McCall for that. Thank you very much, ranking members. Uh, Democrats have been asking that we be allowed to vote, that we allow the membership of the United States House of Representatives to vote, to support Ukraine, to support our allies, to recognize, as you said it so clearly, Chairman McCall, and that we all know that China, Iran, Russia are not our friends. They are our enemies. And when they attack our friends, we must stand with our allies. And that when we have that vote, I'm going to certain it's going to be incredibly bipartisan because there are so many Republicans who also want to stand for democracy, who also want to push back the attacks that Xi Jinping and, and the Ayatollahs and Putin when they attack Ukraine, they also have attacked us in the future and intend to do in the past. I mean, uh, Chairman McCall, would you agree that Russia has malevolent intent to America and will continue to seek to undermine us in ways from cyber attacks to what they're doing in Ukraine and other ways? Well, I grew up in the Cold War, and, um, I, you know, my wife tracked so, uh, Russian Soviet submarines in the Navy. Naval intelligence and, and uh, they, those submarines are back. Uh, they are an adversary. The idea that they're not connected to China—I mean, 
they were holding hands at the Beijing Olympics, talking about the unholy alliance and how he's going to invade Ukraine. And any expert you talk to, every military, Jack, General Jack Keane to Mike Pompeo, will tell you there's a national security interest here because if Ukraine falls, then, then Moldova is going to fall, then Georgia, then the Baltics are at stake. And you're looking at parallels to 1939 all over again. And then eventually they're going to hit accord with the NATO Article 5, and we're going to have to send our men and women over there. And the reason I want this, they're fighting for us is what they tell me. And I want to give them everything they need to at least push the Russians back so we don't have to send our men and women over there. It's called deterrence. If we fail on that and surrender in Ukraine like we did in Afghanistan, does that make the United States does that make it more powerful or weaker? It makes us weaker. As we're not projecting strength. And we lose the trust and confidence of our allies. I think that's a big mistake. Uh, and it, it, it would have a long-term generational impact. I don't want our men and women over there. And, Which is and if why, we do nothing, that's going to happen. Well, thank you very much. And, Chairman, that's why I'm so perplexed at the fact that there are Republicans who oppose supporting Ukraine. Because the Republican history has been condemning Russia. I mean, that changed somewhat. I mean, we had... Well, yeah, I say, what would Ronald Reagan do? What would so Ronald Reagan, Reagan stood, do, He right? stood up to the Soviet Union. Yeah. He brought down the Soviet Union. He was not an isolationist. He believed that we were the leader of the free West. He didn't shrink from that responsibility. I can't speak for my other colleagues. I can just speak for what I believe as a Republican that grew up in had the honor to vote for Reagan in my first election. So, I, you know, I'm with you on the border. God, I wish, I mean, I fought to, you know, we all did. And we passed H.R. 2. And you know what? There will be an election. And and we can get back to what works. But, uh, so, but, getting but back we, can't, to we can't, we can't, we can't <laughs> abandon our allies. We abandoned our allies at this critical point. Then, then where are we then? And I think at this point, and, and, and the, the, the sort of understanding of the evil in, uh, of, of Russia, I think was Republican and Democrat, basically until we hit President Trump, but uh, ranking member, uh, uh, ranking member, you were going uh, yeah, to add to that? Just add a couple of things, which is important. Um, first, talk about the Ukrainian people. You know, I led the last CODEL to Ukraine before the Russian invasion. And what we did, we talked to the Ukrainian people. We didn't just go to the political class. We went and we talked to taxi drivers, bus drivers. We went to restaurants. And we talked to the people. And what we were saying to them was that this threat of Russia attacking was about to happen. We told them that our intelligence said that they would invade. And I will tell you just about, ev not just about, every Ukrainian person that I spoke to said, all you have to do is give us weapons. You don't have to fight America. Give us what we need. And we will fight. They still had in their minds what took place with Crimea. Many had said they had been part of the Soviet Union. They would never wear those green uniforms again. They would fight. They said, don't worry about us fighting. We would win. All we're going to do is ask America is to give us what we need to fight with, and we will beat back Vladimir Putin and the Russians. And that's where we are right now. And guess what? President Joe Biden, many thought, as I'm sure Putin did, that we would be divided from our allies. Many thought that our allies would not work with us, but it was the skill and the diplomacy utilized by Joe Biden which what history will record, guess what? NATO is now stronger than ever. Putin didn't count on it. 
Some of my colleagues here didn't think that it could happen. But NATO, now, who would have thought that Finland and Sweden, long countries that would be neutral, has decided to join NATO in this struggle? Joe Biden helped put that together. Joe Biden, listen, it wasn't America alone because we realized we had to work with all of our allies. We just had the Prime Minister of Japan speak to Congress. Guess what Joe Biden has done in the Indo-Pacific? Japan and South Korea for a long time were just not talking to one another. There was a historic meeting between Japan and South Korea put together by Joe Biden bringing the Indo-Pacific together, working and creating the Quad, in the India, Australia. Look at what we're doing with AUKUS, bringing our allies together. It's not America out there by itself. It's America, we said, and our allies. The skill that Joe Biden has of diplomacy, bringing us together, Working together to defeat, yes, as my colleague said, we must defeat and beat Russia. We must make sure that China, we must make sure that we hold North Korea at bay. Those are the things that we, could, we need to do. And what Joe Biden is doing is putting together those coalitions. How do you combat China? Having a unified Indo-Pacific. And that's what's taking place there. How do you combat Putin? have a unified Europe? How do you, come, how do you uh, combat Iran being unified? That's the skill that Joe Biden has made. That's the skill of the people that Joe Biden has put back to make sure that we are on our road to work together. And now we need to give the Ukrainians what they need so that they can defeat Vladimir Putin. Mr. Chairman, I get to still call you Mr. Chairman. Can, can, I, can I make a slight uh, response to that? I wish you would. Uh, and, and look, I don't, I don't want this to be a, a campaign ad for Joe Biden, uh, and this is very serious. Um, and I'll, I'll say this very objectively, as I see it, as a fairly rational Republican, I think, and, and that is, and, and my friend and I agree a lot, and look, and a lot of what he said, you know, it, it has, ha has happened, but... Um, I have pleaded with this White House on Ukraine to put the weapons in they need to win for two years. And it's been a slow walk. You know, at first it was javelins and stingers and HIMARS and, you know, then F-16s and then attack them. The, the very long range artillery that could take out the bridge between Russia, Crimea. I'm not a general, but I'm, you know, it doesn't take a genius to figure out you cut the supply line, you know. That's written in this bill, by the way. You know, the Cole and Powell doctrines, it, it, give them, either get in, all in, or get the hell out, right? You don't do it halfway. And I've had a criticism of that. Now, I also have another theory that with the collapse of Afghanistan, and that it, the way it was done was so humiliating that it sent ways of weakness around the world to our adversaries and then embolden them and empower them such that Putin for the first time thought, this is my time. This is my time. It's weak. This president looks weak to me. That's when we see the Russian Federation literally within months coming down to invade Ukraine, the alliance with Xi and the Ayatollah rear his ugly head. You have to ask a question, and I'm not trying to be partisan here, why is this all happening? Why is the world on fire? What caused this? So it I, I go back to the old doctrine of Chamberlain and Churchill. Chamberlain, peace in our time. Hitler says not worth the peace papers. Right? Deterrence is key. If we don't provide deterrence, which this bill does, we're going to invite more aggression, more conflict, more war. That's what weakness does. You project strength, you get peace. And I think this bill, so, so what this bill me, will provide the like, deterrence. What so, Scripps did was bring yeah. people together. Right. Because had we not, then NATO would not have been together. What Scripps meant, we couldn't do all the things we wanted that Mr. McCall, that's doing it alone. 
but working with and talking and taking into consideration what our allies were saying. Some of our allies wasn't ready to go there. They would not have been with us. But it's the Biden administration that said, well, let's talk. I'm telling you this is going to happen. This stick with me. Let's stick together. And we can win this thing. Many thought that Germany would not be there because of their deal dealing with Gulf Stream. They said, oh, they would never give up being independent of Russia. Forget them. Let's move without them. Not Joe Biden. Joe Biden said, we can bring them together. We can work together. And the only reason I brought this up is because the way the chairman started out, like not talking about making this a pro-Biden, but not this is trying to make this an anti-Biden. Biden needs, he deserves credit. And history will give him the credit he deserves for bringing our allies together. So I think what's interesting is that I was trying to get to the fact that we have unanimity of vision among the four of you that we need to get this done, right? We clearly do not agree on how we got to this situation, right? Because I look at things and I have here the foreign policy review, which says history will judge the Trump presidency to have been a consequential one but more for its destructive effect, where it goes through and we look at what is the history of Trump, and it was destroying our, our allegiances. It was, you know, cozying up to Putin. I think I kind of don't want to talk about what led. It's like, what is the moment we are facing yeah. now? And the moment we are facing now is one where America is calling on us to act. It's calling on us to be able to vote. And depending on where you stand, if you think your constituents don't want you spending more money on Ukraine or on humanitarian efforts, they'll vote that way. But allow us to vote. And I think that that's where we are at. And I know the appropriators want to speak. And so, uh, 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 Mr. Chair and then Ranking Member. Just quickly, because uh, I agree with my friend. We, we are united on the issue in front of us today. But I also agree with my friend from Texas. There's context. Uh, my friend from New Mexico said, you know, we just want to vote. Honestly, that's all we want from the United States Senate on H.R. 2. And it's been over there for over a year. That's all we want on TikTok legislation that we have all agreed with pretty much over here. And it hasn't come to a vote. That's all we agreed to on a tax bill, for God's sake, that came out of Ways and Means overwhelming. So I understand the frustration of my friends that say all we want to do is get a vote on something we think is important. The United States Senate has not given us things on bipartisan things that we think are important here, not just H.R. 2, but on TikTok, on tax stuff. So uh, I'm glad we're rising above the United States Senate, but we are rising above the United States Senate. We are not trying to hold this hostage. We don't think it's an appropriate thing to do. The United States Senate has held hostage things on the southern border that would make an enormous difference with fentanyl pouring in, child trafficking happening, crime coming in. So uh, while we agree on this issue, we, and we don't agree in context, and quite frankly, again, I'm pleased the president is doing this in terms of Ukraine. Uh, some of my colleagues are not. I respect that. But I will also tell you the Obama-Biden administration did zero when Putin went to take Crimea in 2014. Zero. They never sent lethal aid. They got meals to eat and blankets. You know, the first guy to actually send lethal aid to Ukraine was actually Donald Trump. And we knew for months before this invasion happened that it was coming. We knew for months. Did we send anything early to show them we were serious? Did we deter then? No, we did not. So I also agree with my friends from Texas. Ukraine was a pretty bad signal. If I was sitting in Moscow and I saw the United States uh, liquidate a 20-year commitment and turn 38 million people back over to the very people that hosted Osama bin Laden. I think, well, the damn sure ain't going to fight for Ukraine. So when the historians look at this, they won't start looking at it this vote. They'll go back to 2014, and it'll be a very nuanced picture along the way. Having said all that, to be fair, it's water under the bridge. I mean, I, I, I love history, but I know when the moment is now, the moment is now on this stuff. We do agree because we see it. And I'll leave it to the story and to pin blame and whatever. And uh, again, with all due respect to people on my side of the aisle, that uh, when I find something, uh, to quote my good friend, the ranking member, that I can agree on, uh, as opposed to things where we disagree, I'm going to act. 
I'm not going to try to leverage one against the other. I'm not going to say where we agree, I'm not going to do something with you because over here we disagree and you won't do something. I'm just not going to do that. I don't think it works. I think it leads to gridlock. Uh, but, uh, again, there's a lot of context here. Uh, and I think, you know, it's fair, as my friend from Texas, uh, Chairman, has talked about some of that, too. Because, uh, and to understand where some of the frustration is with people I don't agree with on this issue, but why they're upset that things they think are important can't be voted on in the United States Senate. Uh, we're not asking for a predetermined outcome. We're just asking for a vote. And it's like here. We're not asking for a predetermined outcome. I think one of the strengths of the package in front of us is it's going to let every single member do what they want to do. You know, if you are against aid to Israel and for aid to Ukraine, or some of my friends on the Democratic side, are you going to have that ability to do this? If as you're against Ukrainian aid but for Israel... The speaker is not trying to jam you. He's trying to give every member in the body a choice to pick what they think is important. Uh, I think that's a good thing. And frankly, I think we, I wish we saw more of it in the United States Senate, uh, because this speaker is actually asking, <coughs> trying to provide this House with the ability to work its will. Uh, and I think that's what we have the opportunity to do. Well, and we've... thank goodness we all agree on this particular item. You might not agree with what I said, but on this item, I want to end on a positive note. I couldn't be prouder of my friend, the ranking member on appropriations. I couldn't be prouder of my friend, the ranking member on foreign affairs. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to act with the President of the United States, with whom I disagree on many occasions, but I don't on this one. And I'm not going to let the areas that I disagree with him on stop me from supporting him in a measure where I do agree, let alone with my colleagues who I've had the privilege of working with many times who are great legislators, but on this one we agree, and so happy to be here and support it. Yield back. I'm sorry. So, right. Uh, I mean, the immigration debate, I think, is something that we began last night. It was killed by members of the Republican, uh, 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 the Republican members of this committee. They're not moved forward. Uh, has gone over to the Senate, has not moved forward. There was a bipartisan bill that Trump killed in the Senate, but uh, uh, a ranking member of the law in, in many respects, we, we continue to sit here and to um, deal with revisionist history here. Uh, lest we forget, it was the Trump administration that violated the Impoundment Control Act, illegally uh, withholding security assistance from Ukraine. Let's not forget that when we think about what emboldened Putin, let us not forget the words of the former president, which everyone has uh, invoked here today in some way or another, uh, that uh, Putin is his dearest friend. He knows him. He knows him well. And don't you think Putin is waiting very, very uh, carefully to see another Trump administration. They are joined at the hip. So let's not sugarcoat what is going on here in terms of trying to indict the Biden administration. I want to walk away from this whole debate about administrations because it is not the moment at hand. Uh, one sentence about border security. I sat in the White House, not in the classified meeting, where Republican colleagues said that we won't have Ukraine without bipartisan border security. And then you know what? We accomplished bipartisan border security. It wasn't, and, and it was, oh, you can shake your head all you want, but Democrats and Republicans voted for border security. And you know what? It was Donald Trump who said, don't give Biden a win. You think about that. Put that aside. This moment is now. The United States Senate, you can have all the views you want about the United States Senate, but hold them for this debate. It is now. It is about the United States House of Representatives. We have the opportunity to do what we do here, and that is to govern. And what are we doing in governing? Is it to be a world leader. And for months and months, we have been diddling around where people are dying in Ukraine. Don't talk about what weapons we want to give them. We're not giving them what they need now, and it has been months in the coming. 
And we ought to today, immediately, we should have picked up that Senate bill, brought it to the floor, and voted on it immediately, and we would be out of here today in doing it. Let us not rewrite what is happening. The moment is ours. And if the House of Representatives advocate, abdicates its responsibility, yes, the history will write the story. And that it, it, it is on us when we had that moment, we said no. I, for one, will not say no. I will provide Ukraine with the weapons that it needs to go forward. I would provide Israel what it needs to defend against Iran. I am overwhelmingly in support of our being able to deliver humanitarian assistance at a volume that will meet that need because we're standing by. We're standing by and watch Ukrainians die. We're standing by and watch uh, Palestinians starve to death, Sudanese starve to death, Haitians, etc. If that's the way we want to be remembered in history, it's certainly not the way I want to be remembered. So let's vote on what we need to be doing here today, casting our vote in favor of the national security package. Yeah. Thank you so much. And I think it is casting a vote against starvation. It is casting a vote against deprivation. It is casting a vote for democracy is what we are looking for when we are able to look at this package and vote on us. And I will end with quoting a Democrat president. Democracy is never a final achievement. It is a call to an untiring effort. John F. Kennedy. And we must continue that untiring effort for values that honor civilian lives and for values that honor democracy. And with that, uh, Madam, Mr. Chair, I yield back. The only yields back. Uh, Chair McNeil is a gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Massey. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ranking Member Meeks, you, it sounded like there was some new sanctions and authority in here that you might be uncomfortable with. It, are you comfortable with all the new sanction authority that's granted in this, uh, in the bills that are covered by this rule? Yeah, but the, but many of the problems that I had with this and you know, some of the sanction authorities, there was no waivers for humanitarian aid. We were focused on trying to make sure that innocent individuals are not caught up into it. We've negotiated some, as I've indicated, in three of the bills. We were able to negotiate to get humanitarian aid in them, and it made the bill better and thereby earned in, in, in my support in that regards. But I was concerned about sanctions where there are no waivers. And, and all of those uh, concerns have been taken care of? Yeah, I, basically, they have in four of the bills, you know, so as I mentioned during my opening statement. And, and if I could add, I think, Go for it. I, yeah. think Go ahead. I think Mr. Meeks is offering an amendment yes. uh, on that very issue that I support. We didn't work together. We had good conversations on that. So there's uh, roughly $100 billion in here, most of it for military assistance. Uh, could this be used to purchase cluster munitions, uh, Ranking Member Meeks? Uh, I'm not sure whether it could be used to be for cluster munitions. I know it is. Um, we, are, we are concerned. I know I am concerned about certain cluster munitions and their accuracy so that I'm always concerned about uh, innocent individuals being injured uh, and trying to make sure for humanitarian purpose we don't hurt uh, innocent boys and girls. There's been a, a history of, you know, after wars, clusters in the ground, never designated. People come by and they are devastated as a result of it. So I wanted to make sure, yes, I want to make sure that we are applied or abiding by uh, some of the uh, powers, war powers, a reference to the types of weapons that be utilized. I want to make sure they are weapons that are ordinarily utilized or should be utilized uh, in, 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 in places of war. Would, would you support an amendment to prohibit the, uh, the money in this for going to cluster munitions? Yeah, I would very definitely look at that. That's something that would concern me, yes. Chairman McCall, uh, is there, could the money here in this in the bills covered by this rule be used for cluster munitions? As I understand, uh, that money has already been appropriated in the regular appropriations process, and Mr. Cole may be able to speak to that on uh, the use of cluster munitions. And I know that I understand your concerns with those munitions. Uh, the Russians are using them against the Ukrainians in Ukraine. In Ukraine. Uh, the Ukrainians just want to use them in their own country to get the Russians 
out. They are highly effective uh, weapons. But with respect to your question on the funding, perhaps Mr. Cole can answer this. I think that was in the original package. If I may. Yeah, please, Mr. Chairman, I wasn't even going to ask you any questions, but I'll defer all the time you want. Well, I, I certainly shouldn't, shouldn't pass up on an offer like that. So I, <laughs> but I do just, uh, since uh, uh, Chairman McCall asked, yeah, yeah, the authority is in there on the SFOPS portion, is my understanding. And I agree with uh, Chairman McCall. Again, these have been deployed by the Russians first. Uh, the Ukrainians have asked for the ability to do this within their own country. I'm sure something they would prefer not to do, quite frankly, but they felt that way. And I, I know the president, when we dealt with this issue earlier, because we had an extensive discussion about this on this committee, uh, didn't want to do that either. Uh, uh, but he was reluctantly put in the position where he felt like he had to. So, I, I, again, I think this is one where the moral dilemma is created by our adversaries. It's certainly not created by the Ukrainians. I don't think it's something the Americans uh, uh, want to do. But, uh, you know, war is a terrible thing. And when your enemy uses a weapon uh, and people that are defending themselves ask for the ability to do the same within their own country, it's very difficult for me. And, again, I, I respect those. I know people have a different opinion on this. Uh, on the on this committee, but again, I just wanted to be honest with you. Yes, the authority yeah. is in the bill. I appreciate that, uh, Representative Delora. Would you support an amendment to prohibit the purchase of cluster munitions or transfer of cluster munitions with the the money that's provided in these bills? Well, as it's been said, the authority is there, and uh, we, well, we, uh, we know there's been a, a, a agreement on both sides. Of so the authority to purchase cluster munitions is contained or enabled by the bills in this rule. What if, my question, maybe I was, I'll try to be more clear. Would you support an amendment to remove that authority to purchase cluster munitions with the money in this bill? I, I think that the discussion has been, uh, you know, it has been, uh, I, I think, as I say, the authority is there, and uh, there's been agreement on how to try to move forward on this to account for the various and diverse opinions that agree uh, that agree and disagree on this issue. So I would just uh, stand with where the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the bill currently is on this issue. So that sounds, that sounds like a no. You would not support removing the authority for cluster munitions in the bill. Is that correct? I said what I said. I don't know how many more times I can repeat it. I will support the, okay. uh, the bill that has the authority. Okay. Thank you. Um, I want to move on to the Repo Act, which is one of the many bills contained in the fourth title, I believe. Um, there is some concern expressed by uh, senators during markup, senators who have experience, at least one senator in the banking industry, that uh, this could affect the Treasury market for our own Treasuries. So if I understand correctly, if, if a Russian sovereign fund or Russian bank owns Treasuries that are, that are here in the United States, we would be seizing those Treasuries. Is that correct? Yes. So, um, so here's the, the basis for the concern. So, you know, we auction Treasuries. Occasionally, uh, we have to issue new debt, unfortunately, to cover new expenditures that we haven't paid for and also when old debt expires. And uh, the concern is that when sovereign <clears throat> countries and sovereign wealth funds look at purchasing those treasuries, if we actually consummate this Repo Act, uh, that those countries will have less appetite for what was the most secure investment in the world, which is the U.S. Treasury. They may have less appetite for purchasing it, uh, you know, particularly if they're not an extremely close ally. If they end up on the bad list and, they, and their treasury gets repoed, Mr. McCall, do you share that concern that this may affect the, the U.S. Treasury's ability to sell these uh, financial we've done, we've instruments? We've used uh, this authority in the past, um, and the, the premise is essentially if you cause harm, <clears throat> or injury, you 
essentially sort of waived your sovereign immunity, if you will, and so the the um, assets that are frozen uh, uh, under sanctions um, are, uh, as, as a result, can pay for the harm and injury that has been done by a, a country that is violating international law, which in this case I believe Russia is. And I, I you know, I'll be happy to get back to you on the more minutiae of this, but I would say overall this is a, a very popular provision in this bill because what it says is essentially let Russia pay for its own war crimes, not the American taxpayer. Uh, you know, these are seized Russian assets uh, uh, under international law, legally, uh, and by law, we've done this before, uh, twice, uh, where if a country causes that sort of harm or injury to another country and the assets are seized, and then they can be used uh, for reparations. Um, um, I think certainly if we, once we get into reconstruction, if we ever get there, uh, that would be a wise use as well. I, I don't think most Americans out there want us using taxpayer dollars in any of this. You know? They would prefer it to be uh, from the Russian oligarchs and sovereign assets that have helped pay for Putin's war machine. My concern is that uh, we could end up costing the American taxpayers more because the cost of financing our debt could go up if we reduce the appetite for, for U.S. Treasuries in, when they go for auction. Uh, so <laughs> I hope that's been factored into the cost. Now, this has been used in the past, but as I understand that, we were in conflict. We were engaged in direct conflict. This would be in Iraq, for instance, uh, the Iraq-Kuwait War, uh, and we used sort of United Nations Security Council plan to seize those assets, and they uh, were used for victims of the Iraqi invasion in Kuwait. But the difference there is that we were directly involved in a, in a military action with Iraq. And so this, I believe this would be the first time the United States has seized and repurposed fro frozen sanctioned assets owned by a foreign state, despite the absence of any direct well, military I, I, engagement. I, I mean, I, I, uh, respectfully disagree that in two of those instances, the establishment of the Iran Claims Tribunal in 1981 and 1992, seizure of Iraqi assets for the transfer to the United Nations, the U.S. was not at war with the country whose assets were involved. And I, I believe that the Treasury market is very strong in the United States. I don't think this is going to have a, uh, the dire warning impact that you no, I think it would. the 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 I, again in that circumstance, I believe it was the United Nations, and there was some, uh, I think probably at least some comfort from the other countries that we didn't act unilaterally, and we were acting with other countries, so we weren't acting arbitrarily toward one seizing and repurposing one country's assets. But here we're going alone; we're not doing it with a group of other countries or United Nations Security Council. Um, yeah, we don't do this alone, by the way, and this is also supported by uh, President Trump's former economic advisor and people like Newt Gingrich, people, uh, uh, you know, I, I trust Trump's economic advisor more than some of the sideline, you know, yeah. well, people the, those trying, are, to, trying to get in the game. He thinks it's a great idea. Well, those are, those are people I respect. I'm just, the, the people who buy our treasuries may not respect Newt Gingrich as much as I Well, did. but the, I think the former economic advisor of the president. Right. So. Uh, president Trump, I, 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 he's in strong support of this. This has strong support uh, across, in bipartisan. I, again, the underlying premise being, you know, yeah, I mean, I think. The Treasury market's going to be fine in the United States. I think that the underlying premise is who do you want to pay for this? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I'm worried. I still have that concern. It, there may be bipartisan support here, but I think it sends a signal to the rest of the countries in the world that we may take, tr we just may take your treasuries. Uh, if you buy them from us, we may just take them back. Uh, and I think that's a little bit dangerous. Another. But we're not, we're not doing this. This is not, you know, this is the EU, it's the United States. I mean, they're all involved in these, in these sanctions. I guess you go back to the premise where we have even sanctioned of these assets. So um, 
one other concern that people have expressed in the Repo Act is that we would tie the hands of future president. That's a provision in this bill, I believe, that the that another president can't undo this. It, it, would that be, I mean, is that something the Democrats wanted in here so that Trump couldn't normalize relations no, later I, on? I'm not, I'm, I'm not concerned about what Mr. Trump would do. I'm concerned about what President Biden would do. And we want to ensure, just like with Nord Stream 2, when we sanction that pipeline of energy going from Russia into Europe, and I, we put a presidential waiver in there. And guess what? President Biden waived that sanction that Congress imposed, a mandatory sanction. And guess what? What came out of that? Europe became dependent on Russian energy. I never thought he would do it, but he did. And when you talk about the, the, the clock, the timetable of history, that, that was the first sign of weakness. And Afghanistan came after that. This was designed not for President Trump. In fact, I, President Trump is not going to be bound by this. Uh, well, you know, if he doesn't want to be, I think it's good policy. And it, it was just really because of the history of this president, President Biden waiving congressional sanctions. And we didn't want him to disrespect the Congress again on this one. So does or does it not bind future presidents? I mean, you know, I, I think that can be entertained in, in a future administration. I did it to we did this to tie President right. Biden's hands so he would have to do this. So, have to enforce it. Right. And because of the lack of trust from Nord Stream 2. I, you know, we, we haven't had much time to read these bills. I'm going on prior versions of the bill. And so maybe I'm incorrect here, but I believe it does remove the president's yeah. ability to enter alter sanctions regime. Is, uh, and my concern here is that could limit to the president's yeah. negotiating leverage, you know, and, and undermine the ability to come to some kind of peace deal in the Russia-Ukraine war uh, if the, he has to come back to Congress to undo the sanction? I think the, my understanding from the legislation, once the conditions are met, then the obligation is, is, is completed. And what, what are those conditions? That, that these assets be used to pay for uh, not only uh, the efforts to, that we're undergoing today, but the reconstruction. Well, I think, so that's, that, I'm not, that hasn't ameliorated my concerns, and, and other people still have this concern, that we may have a change in the presidency at the end of this year, and that this conflict could still be going on, and that I, I understand the desire to keep the president, give, keep the president from having a lot of wiggle room here, but it may be keeping him from having wiggle room in a, in a direction that the next president needs yeah. to end a conflict. Again, and I, and I get your point. The, the intent was to bind the current president, current administration, based on the track record of not enforcing sanctions. I'll give you some other examples. Iran. He uh, he uh, let the he's not enforcing the energy sanctions. Iran has sold eighty billion dollars to China. That's funded their terror operations. He uh, he uh, the UN sanctions uh, it lapsed, and I have a bill to fix that on the and it's in this bill on the missiles and drones that Iran is selling to Russia to kill Ukrainians. He's not enforcing that one. Why? Because they want to accommodate and appease Iran to get this Iran deal. Remember the hostage swap? That was a, that was a great one. Six Iranian spies for six innocent civilians, and we paid them $6 billion. And then $10 billion of electricity to, they could sell into Iraq. And, I mean, every, and every time I turn around, they're cutting some deal with Iran to get more money. I don't trust them with sanctions. That's why it's not in here. It's not about President Trump. It's about binding this president. If you want me to write that in there, I will. I think, I think it would be hard to write something depending on who wins the next election. But I think that does appeal to the Democrats, the fact that uh, Trump's hands would be tied uh, it, when he, in this regard. So uh, another concern that I has, have, and I want to know if you have the same concern, is that there may be some retaliation that if I know, I believe the Repo Act, as it's written here, only intends to seize uh, assets, sovereign assets of, that are owned by the country, not private individuals of the country. But yeah. um, is it possible that U.S. assets in, in Russia could get seized as a retaliation 
to the Repo Act? I, 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 I don't believe so. And I think that, um, you know, look, this uh, right now we can only do what sees in this country. Uh, the, uh, when I talk to the NATO allies in the EU, uh, the United States leads, and they will probably follow. Um, a lot of this is in Brussels, as you know, but there's also a provision that, um, you know, I think the theory is, at least I know if you want to get into the former president, that um, he supports, you know, this uh, loan program. He, he wants the idea that we're going to continue to help them so that when he gets into office, he can negotiate a better agreement. And this would be, there's a provision that once he accomplishes that, that this uh, obligation would be relinquished. So speaking of the loan forgiveness and the, lo the loan aspect of the Ukraine money, uh, it sounds like a good idea. I think they're probably not going to have the ability to pay it back, so it's almost kind of moot. Why wouldn't we loan the money to Israel and Taiwan and the other countries that are in here? They have the capacity to pay it back, so why not loan it to them? So the uh, – I hate to put my colleague on the spot here. That's more in the appropriations bills. It's not in my provision. But I'll, I'll tell you what I think. I mean, look – He's the former chairman, so I prefer not to put him on the spot. <laughs> but that, <laughs> he was so I mean, kind to everybody in those chairs when he was in that chair. I, I, I will say that that, that provision is not in, in, in my, our, this bill that uh, Mr. Meeks and I have worked on. Uh, Mr. Meeks, Ranking Member Meeks, why wouldn't we have a, a loan forgiveness? Or Sorry. I see that we have a loan and, and uh, program for Ukraine. If that's a great innovation, why don't we do that to, for the money that's going to Israel and Taiwan? Again, that's appropriation as opposed to. <laughs> okay, I'll ask Ranking <laughs> Member Laura. <laughs> it's trying every way in the world to save you from this, Chairman Cole. Hey, man, it's, it's, in, it's in your bill, man. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and it may be. I, I could have it talked about the Republican demand. <laughs> you know, I'm sorry. Can we have it, order? It may have been. I wasn't a party to it, but it may have been a Republican demand in order to get funding for Ukraine. That's what may have simply been it's a totally political issue in order to get to people who do not see the value, the U.S.'s value, in providing aid to Ukraine. So you all ought to think about that and whether or not. It is not really, and I should say that for me personally, it was the, the Senate package came forward with the way it was without this, but it was this is what the Republican majority wanted to do. So please talk to your colleagues about that. Do not talk to the Democrats about that it. Is, I, don't, I don't want to right, sit. Because, as I said in my opening statement, all of these are Republican-led bills. I didn't even want to do a side call. We didn't have to. I just wanted to do the Senate Take bill. responsibility. Yeah, if I can okay. if I, I add, the, um, the loan program, though, you know, the EU has the same program with Ukraine, uh, this loan program. And so we th thought that it made sense, and I think the former president agreed, that, you know, make this a loan, not just a giveaway. Ranking member uh, DeLauro, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I'd like you to sum up your opinion on the loan aspect of the money that goes to Ukraine. Do you believe it's a gimmick? Uh, look, I, 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 you know, as I said, I was very, very supportive of um, – uh, I'm not supportive of using loans for emergency needs. That's never been – that hasn't been uh, the, the way in which we have moved in the past, okay? So it was the House Republicans' cost. You ready for that? The House Republicans' cost for getting the funds. It is a bad precedent. But that was the only way in which we could move on funds for Ukraine. And you want to talk about trying to get something done? We're here to try to get something done, not to put roadblocks, uh, barriers to wherever you want to go on getting aid to Ukraine. That is what our job is to do. Forgivable loan, bad precedent, and which I, I'm opposed to, did not come out of the Senate bill, but that's how we needed to. That was the Republicans' price. So please, talk to your colleagues about it. Don't talk to the Democrats. 
It sounds like you support the bill, though. So uh, somehow you got. I support the bill because we need to get aid to Ukraine. You know, and uh, I, 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 you know what? It's about someone mentioned up here. What we do in this in, the, in this body, and I've negotiated along with with uh, 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 with, with Chairman Cole uh, appropriations bills over the years. Does everybody get what they want? No. Do we um, uh, really compromise on issues for the greater good to try to move forward? Yes. That is what is called governing. That's why we all come here. That is, we come here uh, to uh, be able to govern and to get things done. In this respect, getting aid to Ukraine is imperative. All right, let me, let me move on and ask about Gaza. How much money is in here for Gaza, uh, Ranking Member Meeks? Well, it's $9 billion for humanitarian aid, not all of which is going to Gaza, but it's for humanitarian aid throughout the world, is as how, it was in the Senate bill. Um, how much, uh, Ranking Member DeLauro, how much of that will go to Gaza? That's, uh, that is uh, uh, really, there isn't a specific number. As you probably know or maybe don't know, they never do earmark the funds uh, that go to humanitarian assistance because something can come up in which there needs to be the flexibility in order to be able to provide humanitarian aid. As I said in my remarks, you are looking at Sudan, you're looking at Haiti, you're looking at Somalia. Uh, people have talked about uh, uh, you know, I mean, the, 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 the countries that are in the greatest need, including, uh, including Gaza. So uh, there is not a specific dollar amount. Okay. I want to ask about the top line. How do we get the top line numbers for the, the military aid? Where did those come from? Anybody want to answer that? I'll ask well, Ranking the, Member the, DeLore. The, the numbers, uh, quite honestly, mirror what came out of the Senate. And uh, so that this package, and that is what, that's what the, uh, a speaker has uh, talked about, uh, and this is what the agreement was, is to, uh, and, and it was back, back and forth in which they came forward with what essentially uh, was the, the, uh, the Senate um, uh, uh, a package. And so these top-line numbers are pretty much what the Senate top-line numbers are? It's the, what came out of the, the, the uh, um, uh, well, it, it, it it first came forward with what the, you know, the, 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 the president had proposed earlier on, and then there was the deliberation about it in the Senate. The Senate came forward, and that the, the numbers that are, are, are been proposed here are essentially uh, the numbers that had been asked for earlier on uh, in, this, in this process. Going back, I think, several months. This, the speaker told me that uh, the reason the numbers are both the same is they both came from the Pentagon. And I, I, look, I have to imagine, I, you know, the numbers didn't come out of the air. When you do the, you know, you're, you're looking at what the estimates are, what's needed, what the, yeah, what, uh, what the cost. And, 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 and by the way, I, I think it was mentioned, but we can look at what the, um, uh, 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 you know, it's probably coming from the administration and from the Pentagon, but there's money in here that deals with the replenishment, uh, which is estimated, I think, there's an estimate of uh, 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 overall of about $50 billion. That is for the U.S. Uh, industrial base. And, I, I, you know, we are providing uh, the weapons, and then we need to make sure that we deal with national security, domestic national security, um, and that money is replenished. That's in here. That comes from the administration and the, from the Pentagon. The gentleman yields. Um, I'll yield to Mr. Nagus. Uh, I'm going to interject here. We we do have a lot to get through today, so I'm going to ask people to be respectful of each other on the time. Uh, we've been pretty generous. Then maybe I won't yield and you use your time. Sure. Mr. I think that's what I would suggest. <laughs> <laughs> I, we'll I was save going the to, colloquy for five yeah, minutes from now. Okay, I was going to yield, but better judgment intervened. Uh, <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> Okay, but here's here's the reason I asked the question. You know, the numbers come from the Pentagon, and I know they're, the yeah, and I know they're, quote, the experts. But I, I'm a little bit concerned that any amendment that's offered in here that would reduce the money in any account is somewhat doomed to fail. 
because this has sort of been pre-conferenced with the Pentagon. You know, we talk about pre-conference as something we've agreed with the Senate and they've agreed with us and this thing will go through like, you know, grease through a goose uh, as soon as you pass it in the House. But the, the problem that I have is I think it's been pre-conference with the Pentagon and too frequently we just accept their numbers and, um, and then do everything we can in our power, the leadership does, to make sure that we don't change a single penny. I think if somebody got an amendment made in order here in this rules committee today to reduce some amount of money, uh, it would it would go down in flames because everybody just trusts the Pentagon. And, uh, you know, when we trusted the Pentagon, we get, you know, four hundred dollar hammers and two thousand dollar toilet seats. Actually, that might be a fair price based on inflation these days. But in the 90s, that was a big deal. Uh, so I think we need we should provide more pushback and not just take for granted the numbers that the Pentagon sends us. And that's what concerns me about the numbers here. The, the last uh, topic of legislation in this bill that I want to talk about, Mr. Chairman, is the uh, so-called TikTok ban. This was uh, not unanimously supported on the floor of the House. It's been described as a sweetener in the bill. Uh, doesn't sweeten the package for me at all. It's a, it's a, it's kind of sour, if you ask me, and my concern is, why does the bill allow the president to ban not just apps but websites? And there are three conditions under which the president can can ban a, uh, an app or a website. Either it's 10 percent owned by a foreign adversary country or it is uh, domiciled in a foreign adversary country. Or the third option, which is most concerning to me, is that it's controlled by a foreign adversary country. Now, there's, there's an article out today about me saying that I'm a, a friend of Putin simply because I've not voted for the aid to Ukraine. So there are those in the media who would declare me uh, an adversary of, of, of things or a friend of Putin. And, and I am concerned that that is a large loophole in the TikTok bill that should should not be in there because we shouldn't give the president broad authority to declare foreign adversary countries and or then declare an app or a website under the control of foreign adversary country. Uh, Chairman McCall, do you, do you have any concern about giving the president that much authority? Well, as I understand that provision, it, it applies to successor uh, corporations that would purchase, uh, say, a bite dance. Uh, that would perform the same uh, functions as TikTok does, controlled by the PRC with the algorithms that then control the narrative that's uh, manipulated. Uh, and, and to understand this concept, I mean, TikTok ByteDance um, has these algorithms. Uh, they perpetuate a narrative that, that I believe persuades the thought, sort of thought control in the United States by the PRC. For instance, you type in uh, Israel-Palestinian, you're going to get a very pro-Palestinian version, you know, in TikTok. A lot of it's influenced by China's narrative, not the United States. Our concern is, as well is, is what they can do with your phone. Uh, they can uh, get your keystrokes. Um, they can manipulate your messaging. Um, they, they know all your website, uh, and everything you're doing, all your personal data on your phone is vulnerable to the PRC. So, I mean, it, you as a libertarian of all people, I, if you like, if you want to protect privacy, I want to protect privacy from the PRC. I don't want the PRC in my phone. And what's, what I like about the bill is that it, it requires, um, ByteDance to divest itself in the United States. Um, and that means another company, uh, hopefully an American company, would buy it. It has the algorithms. It just wouldn't be under the control of the PRC and the PRC narrative that they can manipulate with the algorithms. Isn't it true, though, that they already divested their data storage to an American company here in the United States? But not their algorithms. Not their algorithms. Yeah, and that's the key. Can we force a company to show us their algorithm? They're saying, you know, you can't, uh, you have to divest your assets in the United States. But what happens if uh, somebody declares, if the president, we've given the president, not Congress, 
think I could be more comfortable with the bill if it said Congress is banned, you know, may come back and, and decide there's a successor company that's substantially the same thing um, that's spying on Americans and sending it to foreign uh, countries. But this, this bill, I'm afraid, is so broad that if you have the wrong president or the wrong president's cabinet, that they could use this bill to declare a, a, an app or a website as controlled by a foreign adversary, not owned by, not domiciled in, but controlled by. And um, that's, that's a concern that I have because we have seen, we have seen these programs abused by the executive branch. We're, we have a weaponization of government committee where we, we saw CISA, a bill that passed Congress in 2018. It's been abused. It's at the center of Missouri v. Biden. They call it, the attorneys there call it the nerve center for the censorship of, of Americans on social media. And I'm just afraid that we are creating another authority for the executive branch where we could have withheld some discretion to keep the president, whoever that may be, we don't know who's going to win the next election, uh, whoever that may be, may abuse that authority. So that's... that's well, let, me, let me say I respect that. And, you know, if that if we see that occurring, this would be success, successor corporations in the PRC conducting the same type of, of behavior. And let me just remind uh, the, the committee that uh, Congress banned TikTok amongst ourselves. We, we banned TikTok in, within the Congress and the federal government. If we're going to do that with members of Congress... Because every national security expert, intelligence, military, they will tell you that this is a, a spy balloon in your phone, like a Chinese spy balloon in your phone. And if you're worried about privacy, as I know you are, you should be extremely worried about that. And if we don't think Congress should be uh, using TikTok, why in the world would we let our children use it? Just, or the American people. Just to be clear, there are a lot of congressmen who are using TikTok, maybe not on official phones or on government computers. Well, uh, they do I'm not, they're, they're, you know. I'm not one of them. Yeah. My, my concern was shared by somebody, some lobbyists who uh, have websites that are for online shopping or online reviews or for travel reviews, and they got a carve-out in this TikTok ban bill because they had the same concerns that I had, that it could be broadly applied. And so... You know, that, that gives me some concern that they got that carve-out in there. Do you, do you know why they had that carve-out? Does anybody know? It's, I think it requires di divestiture. Um, look, it, it, I'd be happy to work with you on this. So, uh, if, But, you know, the, 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 the intent behind the, the law is for ByteDance to divest its you know, it's company, so it's owned by a either an American company or an ally. It's not going to use these algorithms to, uh, you know, provide mind control, thought control on our children in the United States. A, and, and and not only that, but it, tracking your keystrokes, you know, getting into your what you're looking at on on your websites, just, just all like this data in your phone. You have more data. I mean, this is this is you, right? This phone has everything about you, and it should be protected and very private. And the last country I want looking at my phone, and I'm sanctioned by the PRC, by the way, <clears throat> is China. So um, just closing this out, the TikTok bill was authored by a member of Congress who's going to leave on Friday, <laughs> and this may be passed on Saturday. So I wonder, is there any precedent for somebody getting a bill after they passed the, the primary sponsor of a bill, he's actually got two titles in, in this rule. There are two titles in the fourth, sorry, there are two bills of his that he authored in the fourth title that's covered by this rule, and he's not even going to be here on Saturday. My understanding, and I can't speak for Mr. Gallagher, is that he, he's agreed to stick around for the vote. For the vote on Saturday. Correct. Correct. So this is his going away gift. Yeah, I would think he would stay to get his going away present. Uh, well, which I is my, yeah, it's a good is, yeah, we should, should, My understanding, we, we should be here for about the motives of another member who's not here. Yeah. It, uh, is the yeah. gentleman prepared to well, get back his time? Um, I have one question for the chairman, if he'll indulge me. Uh, you know, I've been on this committee, and I've always tried to – when I got on this committee, I said surprises are for little kids at birthday parties, not – 
you know, congressman, and I've never, I've tried to never surprise anybody. I've disappointed a few people, but I've never surprised them. I tell them what I'm going to do, and I've told the chairman what I'm going to do in this situation. But there's, there's speculation in the media, I don't know where it came from, that, the, that this rule will change the threshold for the motion to vacate. Is the chairman aware of, of that going to, is that going to be included in this rule? You know, I've not seen the, the rule written down, so I, I, will, I will have to leave that for right now. We'll certainly have a chance to visit about it before we vote on it. So you're not aware of any effort to do that? I haven't directly been informed. I've, like you, seen things in the press, but I, I don't have any direct knowledge of that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. General yields back. <clears throat> Chair's going to yield to the gentleman from Colorado. And once again, I want to remind members we have a history up here of being very, very generous with our time, but there are, time marches on. So with the, that bearing in mind that Tempest Fugit, the gentleman from Colorado, was recognized for his questions. Well, I thank the chairman. Uh, there are nine Republican members of the Rules Committee. That, that uh, admonishment is probably best left for uh, his, uh, for our colleagues on the other side of the aisle who, who have uh, uh, been very verbose today. But Mr. Goodness, I, 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 I use no time. <laughs> Mr. Reschenthaler used no time. Mr. Okay. Fishbach used no time. So just bear that in mind. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, nonetheless, uh, I'd like to ask a couple of questions. First and foremost, I guess I would just associate myself with the remarks of the ranking member, ranking member DeLauro uh, in particular. I thought she gave an impassioned defense of the past 65 days. Uh, from my standpoint, I think it's shameful that it has taken 65 days since the Senate passed the National Security Supplemental on a bipartisan basis with 70 votes to get to this point, to finally be in a position in which we could consider individual component bills that largely resemble, uh, with the exception of the, the sidecar, which we'll get to, uh, the Senate bill, while our allies across the globe have been waiting for the Congress to act, waiting for House Republicans to act. Finally, we're poised to do so. Uh, and I'm disappointed that it's taken this long, but nonetheless, I'm grateful that we'll have, I hope, an opportunity to finally get this done in the next 48 hours. I do have some questions about the sidecar, and, I, and in particular the bill that Mr. Massey was, uh, well, he covered a number of bills, but in particular one of the bills that he asked uh, Chairman McCall about, the Repo Act. First and foremost, uh, Ranking Member Meeks, how many bills are in this sidecar bill? In the, how many bills? There are... Well, I can tell you there's no Democratic bills. I can tell you that. Well, you've but gotten to my second question. My understanding is there are 15 one, bills. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. 15 bills that have been packaged into this sidecar agreement. None of them are Democratic bills. Uh, Chairman McCall, I have great respect for you. And we've enjoyed working with you. But I have to say I'm very disappointed that there isn't a single Democratic bill that the Republican leadership could not identify to put into this larger package because I am aware of many bills that have passed your committee on a bipartisan basis that would merit inclusion. One bill. There's can, one can, Democratic bill. Can I respond? Of course. By all uh, means. Every one of these bills is bipartisan. Understood. Has strong, and, and we, that was our litmus test that we didn't want to put in. We weren't going to put the bill that was just a the Republican bill. We picked bills that were bipartisan bills. And, and for a good reason. I mean, practically, you're not going to be able to pass it. You know? There are many bills within the package, Mr. Chairman, that I'm supportive of. My point is each one of them are Republican-led bills. I understand they have broad bipartisan support. Mm -hmm. But I would just encourage you in the future. I mean, I mean, we have a number of issues, hot spots around the world. Your mm -hmm. committee is deeply uh, engaged in addressing those challenges, and I would just encourage the committee, uh, because I know you and the ranking member have a productive and, yeah, uh, and robust partnership, and I think it's important to include bills from the minority in I agree. a package like And this. every time we have a markup, I give the ranking member, we pass uh, Democrat-sponsored bills, and they're all sitting over there in the Senate. I wish they would uh, pass the Democrat bills we passed out of my committee in the Senate as well, and um, we'll talk Sloan to the has a bill on data but... privacy that we included in there as well. Oh, in any event, uh, Repo Act. Mm. 
My question, Chairman McCall, I'm trying to understand your argument and the, the exchange you had with my colleague from Kentucky. So it's your position that you have structured that bill to limit President Biden because you believe that he won't enforce the provisions of the bill? Is that your, that's your argument? We, because he has waived sanctions, including Nord Stream 2 and others, and we believe this issue is, is so important to protect our children from the threat of the PRC, uh, we didn't want him to waive this provision. We wanted it enforced um, because he um, has, has President Biden put a waiver. This bill? It, could, it could pass, but he, he could choose not to enforce it. Has he opposed it? Has the administration no. put out a statement on administration policy against the bill? Uh, I don't no. The answer is no. The Biden administration is not opposed to the bill. No. Part of my frustration, Mr. Chairman, just in all, again, all candor here, is that I don't think it's an intellectually consistent argument to suggest that this president, President Biden, who has forcefully, forcefully made the case against Russian aggression in Ukraine, that your fears are about his abilities or his capabilities to hold the line and not the former president's, which, of course, was the nature of my colleague's criticism uh, well, from Kentucky. When we were um, – and we had a similar bill in my right. committee. They were not very keen about this bill in the beginning. Sure. So I guess it's kind of a trust thing that we want – it enforced, and we don't want a waiver that he will exercise like he's done on Nord Stream 2 and Iran. And and, those, and, and if I could, Mr. Chairman, uh, in response to um, Mr. Massey, who's not here now, but the financial markets understand the targeted nature of this action to address Russia's egregious and illegal behavior. Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell testified to the Financial Service Committee that it will not undermine the dollar, and the U.S. Treasury Department is of the same view. I just want to clarify that. Is the gentleman so, asking that his consent to place into the record? Yes, I am, sir. Without objection, it's ordered. So it sounds like, Mr. Chairman, I think your, your answer was it's a trust issue and that you have more trust. I guess your argument is you have more trust for former President Trump than President Biden. That's I your think that was an issue that ra was raised by Mr. Massey about uh, uh, tying his hands and, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, but I, I just – you talking about repo or TikTok? I'm talking about the repo act. Okay. I'm talking about the repo act because I, I, I am struggling to understand how a straight-faced argument could be made <laughs> that that bill was constructed in a way to somehow limit President Biden's hands because you don't trust him to implement this policy as opposed to former President Trump. It's Let not, me tell it's, you it's – not, it's, not it's not to, to be uh, uh, insulting to the president. It's just that we want this and we want this done. He does have a track record of, of waiving sanctions. Sure. Th this and, is why and, it's... and he's done it several times. The Nord Stream was the most egregious one that we never thought a, a president would do that. Okay, let me, let me try to explain. I hear you, Mr. Chairman. I'll try to explain my skepticism. The White House has not issued a statement of administration policy against the Repo Act. Uh, they have not given any indication that they won't forcefully implement the laws that we pass. The former president, although I don't know how he feels about this bill, but clearly his acolytes in the Congress vociferously oppose this bill because they believe that it will tie former President Trump's hands if he is elected president. So it's, it's a tough argument for me to understand that you're making, that clearly all of his allies believe that you are doing this to tie his hands, not President Biden's, notwithstanding the argument that you're well, making I guess, today. Uh, you know, I appreciate your argument. Uh, but, you know, why are you concerned about there not being a waiver if you believe the president won't waive it? Oh, I'm not concerned about there well, not being what, a waiver. What is the, then what is I, the concern I am here? concerned about you if making— If he's not going to waive it, then why correct. do you care if there's a waiver in there? My concern is that you have made the reasoning, the impetus for that provision, apparently your belief that President Biden will— Will we somehow just, waive it when, when clearly that is not the case. Clearly, the fear then, then is that no former concern. President Trump. There's no concern here, is there? Uh, no concern for me. I'll tell you who the concern is from. Let me read you a tweet. This is from former President Trump's son. This was tweeted yesterday. It pains me to read this. These are not my words. Quote, why are these 
Again, it pains me. Why are these GOP leadership losers like at Rep McCall pushing a bill that would do the bidding of, a, of Democrats and hurt my father's ability to negotiate an end to the war between Russia and Ukraine? That, that's his tweet. My point is simply that President Biden has been very clear about holding Russia accountable. And what I take great resentment at is the implication that somehow this Repo Act is being structured in a way uh, to guard against mistrust of President Biden, when that's clearly not the case, nor is it the way anybody externally is reading the situation. Ranking Member Meeks, I'm welcome to, welcome no, to expound I, I, on that if you Look, I, I, I agree with you. I mean, I don't – I have more concerns about President Trump, you know, especially when it comes to Russia, because if you go by history, if I recall correctly, it was President Trump that had the prime minister of Russia in the White House showing him classified material. It was President Trump who just recently said to Russia, do what the hell you want to our allies. So – Clearly, the concern would be on what President Trump would do with reference to his relationship with Russia. It is President Trump who said he trusts the information, the intelligence of Russia over the intelligence of the United States of America. Who are you going to trust? That's not, that's not uh, President Biden. Those are the words of the former president of the United States. And you're going to trust him with Russia? Well, I certainly agree. I support the Repo Act. I, I, I am glad that it has been included uh, in that particular sidecar. And I just think it's important that we have honest, straightforward debate about the bills that we're considering and the reasons undermining them. I respect you, Mr. Chairman. And can I just add, this of course. passed out of the uh, Energy and Commerce Committee, uh, 40 to 2. Right. Pretty, pretty. Very bipartisan bill. It's a very, yeah. And, and in the Senate as well. a very large margin. Very much yeah. so. Yeah. And, I, and I'm hopeful. And I'm not trying to tie anyone's hands. I mean, I, hear you. I just think it's an important issue to protect our children from the, the communist China. As do I. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Chairman yields back, Chair. Thanks, the gentleman. The gentleman from Texas is recognized. I thank the chairman and gentleman from Texas. I thank uh, each of you for being here part of the Rules Committee, uh, particularly uh, good to see you, Mr. Cole, um, just a week removed. Um, uh, a couple, couple of uh, just questions generally to make sure, just for the record, and, and, I, and I don't want to belabor this, but I, I, I do want clarity because there's a lot that's been flying around. Um, we are all aware disagreements aside of the uh, porous nature of our uh, southern border. Um, not going to dwell on it. We, we've, we've covered it. But, but obviously, uh, as I've stipulated, and I think uh, uh, my friend from Texas, uh, Chairman McCall, would, would agree, I mean, we've had an, an un, uh, uh, you know, godly number of, of people that have been flooding across the border and dealing with all the issues involving that, um, tragedies we've recounted numerous times here. In particular, uh, the data that was released recently that it, we're, we're at 24,300X, I think, um, Chinese nationals that have uh, come across the southern border that we know of, not counting Godaways, which is a number that is exceeds all of 2023 fiscal year. So in six months, we've exceeded all of FY23. And that compares to a number of about 381 in FY21, the last year in which it was President Trump's policies predominantly driving the reality of the border. Um, is that... I assume the chairman would agree that that is, poses a um, not insignificant national security threat to the United States of America, that we've got those kinds of numbers um, from what I'm understanding to be 85 percent single adults uh, of that number of, you know, so we're not talking about a lot of children and so forth, of that number of 24,300 necks in six months. Does, does the chairman agree with that? Uh, I do. It is a national security threat. And let me just say, <coughs> when we were uh, – in the White House at the beginning of the discussions, it was going to be four threats, threat from Iran, the threat from Putin, the threat from China, and then the threat from our southern border. That's the back door. If, if we don't have the back door shut and the threats come in, and you know, as I do, as chairman of Homeland Security, when you're talking about 350 on the terror watch list and how many how many do we not know about? 
when the world's on fire and Hamas is out there and Afghanistan is turning into a terror ground again, they released all these prisoners from the Bagram base that are ISIS-K and Al-Qaeda. I'm very concerned that something's going to happen. And I think something will. And, 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 and it's again, a real just, threat to our national security. Yeah, and, and I agree with the chairman. I, and I would just say, without, you know, we, there, there's a whole bunch of stuff. But just in general, those numbers, the uh, extent to which you've got the fentanyl seizures have been running at about 1,000 pounds a month. Uh, the numbers just last month alone were about 190,000 at the southern border, I think close to 250,000 when you factor in southern border plus parole plus uh, northern border and others yeah. uh, of the number of people apprehended. But, again, that's not counting the gotaways. Um, and then you've got the, the known or suspected terrorists, the gentleman just referring to, um, that uh, were already at about, you know, half of what we had last year, which was a, a real high at 169 is the date, date I have. That might be a little variable. But that, but that specifically the policies of parole, um, for example, we have at least uh, a known homicide su suspect entering via the CBP-1 app just last year, July 2023, who was released into the United States and, and committed a murder and, and, uh, and was arrested in Middletown, New York. My, my point of all of that is, and, and without going through all of that, is all of that is front and center. A lot has been wrapped into the, the political drama around HR2 and whether you would do it or don't do it and who has it and all that. But just simple fact of the matter, though, is in this year, who's, whoever's fault it is, whether it's President Biden's or whether it's, uh, you know, MAGA extremist Republicans, to use the vernacular of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, whoever's fault it might be, it remains true today that we have not passed and got the president to sign into law anything that would meaningfully change or alter what's happening at the border in a significant way. Um, Is that a I, true well, characterization? We have not. Uh, well, we passed H.R. 2 out of the House. Right. Yeah. I said, but signed into law. Right. So we've passed out of the House. But again, yeah. even just the back and forth aside about whose fault it all is, yeah. what has not happened is we have not signed into law anything to deal with the border. But can I can I uh, make make a point? Yeah. I agree with that. I, and I've been you know I've been doing this for a long time. Sure. This is an enforcement issue. It's not as much of a legislative issue. We throw more money at this thing, but the problem is this. We had policies in the prior administration that worked. You know, Remain in Mexico has been on the books for 30 years. It's just we finally had a president that would enforce it. So a lot of this, we could enact, but if he's not going to enforce it, and, and that's it, Remain in Mexico, you know, I marked that up out of my committee as an HR2. Uh, he chooses, he would rather us give him cover with a, some bipartisan watered-down bill than something like he could go back to what the Trump administration did with existing authorities and secure that border. He's the one that made the choice not to do it. He reversed the policies. When I went over, uh, when we present our case to the Senate uh, in the so-called trial that didn't happen, get this. Mayorkas, there's a statute, as you know, aggravated felons must be detained, shall be detained. You know, as an attorney, that shall means mandatory. Yep. Who are aggravated felons? Murderers, rapists, pedophiles, drug traffickers. And he sends a memo to his board patrol agent saying, hey, don't take prior convictions into account when determining whether to detain. So what was the result of that policy? All these dangerous, violent criminals released in our society. So, and, and I agree with the chairman, and I'll just, I'll just move to the conclusion on this, which is that um, – uh, I, only partially, I partially agree with the chairman. I recognize his point. I agree with the general point about the, the blame there. Uh, where, where, where my position is is that there's an Article One responsibility to yeah. force an administration that doesn't follow the law to, to follow the law, and importantly, to recognize that even under a president that does follow the law, whether it was Obama or Trump or anybody before, you know, Jay Johnson recognized problems. We had problems with the Trump administration, with TVPRA, with Flores, with uh, judicial opinions, with a cross-section of the law that's hard to enforce – all of those things that we need to address it, and we need to address those issues in order to actually secure the border, and Congress does need to act. And so my question is, and I, we know the answer, and we have disagreements on the merits of weighing what we should do on these things. But to be clear, we had a rule last night that was focused on an HR2 play. Some of us disagreed with that play because we thought it was, frankly, a, a fiction. It was just a, it was a sideshow that wasn't going to result in anything. So, but this rule will not include anything that touches the border in any meaningful way. That's correct, right? 
Well, there is a, se a separate vote on the border with a separate rule. Correct. Yeah. And that, that rule we took up last night, that's been yeah. effectively suspended. Um, uh, it, but we we have not, uh, nothing in this bill, this rule, the set, the set of bills that we're talking about here would address the border, correct? Yeah, I mean, you know, like you're getting above my pay grade a little bit, but let me just say, uh, from a pragmatic standpoint, um, they have not entertained HR2. They will not entertain it now. Um, and uh, the situation is very dire in the spots that we're trying to address. And, you know, I, you know, I wish it was I, – I agree with you. We're both from Texas. And I wish it was a perfect world. And, and I hear, I hear the know. chairman, and I'm not sure – and I, I do not mean to put him on the spot about yeah. Texas and what we're doing and, the, and weighing all yeah. of this. I'm just for the purposes of the for, the – for those who are reaching a calculation that's different than some of our colleagues – that it is important for the world to know that we are going to proceed with a rule here that is going to advance foreign aid to the tune of $95 billion, roughly, of various forms and fashions, predominantly two-thirds of which going to Ukraine, another block going to Israel, another block going to Taiwan, another block going to submarines and other stuff and things that, you know, are overall defense uh, needs, and that, it, that none of that, none of it, is going to address the southern border. And I agree with the gentleman that money wouldn't help the southern border. you got to have changes to force the administration to enforce the, the law. Asylum is a general no. Correct. Yeah. And parole. And, and the brain of yeah. parole. So the second question is, is of the, that, that I believe I am correct, that of the dollars that are going, that, that the, the loan, I'm sorry, the, yeah, the loan program only really applies to the, I'm going to roughly round the $8 billion-ish of the non-lethal accounts, right, that, that are for the, that the Ukrainian government can use for other purposes. Is that roughly correct? That the loan can only apply to that subset of the money. And so then of that, I am under the understanding that the president can forgive up to 50 percent of that, and the other 50 percent could, could be forgiven in the future, but only with congressional action. Is that a correct characterization? I'm looking back at staff, too, because I'm always, like, wondering it. Is that, is that, am I, just, I just don't have the facts, because, yeah, and Mr. Cole, if you have the answer to that, too. Uh, yeah. Chairman, uh, Chairman Cole. As I understand it, um, yes, although there's still a congressional component. That is, we could disapprove of right. the loan forgiveness. Okay. So, so, so the president right. could unilaterally not – the president could decide to forgive, but we could disapprove of Correct. that forgiveness. Correct. Got it. And then in the future, Congress would have to be consulted before uh, 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 forgiving the second half. That's also correct. Okay. All right. Just for – just so I know. There is, as I think – the uh, Democratic ranking member acknowledged, uh, I think, we all, that there is humanitarian aid, uh, that some of which could go to Gaza, uh, and that that's, we're acknowledging that of some amount of the $9 billion, it wouldn't be the full amount, right? Because some of that's for refugees, some of it's for foreign aid, but there's five-ish, $5.6 billion, I think, of the nine or something like that, that could ultimately get to uh, Gaza. Well, but I thought it wasn't oh, – no, I'm not trying to be pejorative. I mean, it's just facts. I thought of the $9 billion, I thought four-ish <coughs> is, is refugee-specific and another. Is that not true? Do I have that wrong? Okay. I thought it was like – I thought there was a characterization. Is that, is that not accurate, that like 5.x is available for humanitarian generally and like four-ish is specific to refugees? Apparently there are two accounts, but they're mostly for the – you know, it's it's not divided, but it's okay. The way in which you did. Okay. There I'm just again just in which that money flows. I'm just trying to that for for the for the sure. few members watching all of this and a few Americans, I want them to at least know know the facts on it. Um, obviously, I've got concerns about that in terms of dollars that can flow and end up in the hands of of uh, of uh, Hamas. Can I, can I, um, yeah, uh, sure. The one point is, uh, and uh, this this was a very important point is we prohibit all funding to UNRWA. Sure. Because UNRWA, you know, as you know, 12 employees were part of the invasion of yep. Israel. They were, their headquarters were underneath, uh, you know, uh, or Gaza's head, uh, Hamas's headquarters were underneath UNRWA in yep. the tunnel. So none of this money goes, can go to UNRWA. Sure, and I appreciate that, and that is a good move. And I, I introduced legislation three years ago to defund, uh, you know, UNRWA, uh, recognizing why that's a travesty. I wish we'd have done that before October 7th. Um, we had votes in our appropriations bills last September to do that. I applaud Republicans. We, we were trying to do that. Um, but I would, I would note, though, that uh, a lot of these funds are fungible, and, and just knocking down that one account on UNRWA doesn't necessarily prohibit through these billions of dollars flowing. Uh, and in fact, many watchers of this, including friends of mine in Israel, yeah. who, have been, who have raised the question to me yeah. in direct communication saying this additional money, while we're funding Israel and they want the funds, and they do, 
Uh, they recognize this money would be used by an administration that is hell-bent on, frankly, interfering with Israel yeah. to find a way to get that money to ways well, that, and if it gets to Gaza, it gets to Hamas. But my, uh, my direction is private NGOs, you know, Catholic Relief Services, right? World Food Program. These are, you know, David Beasley, World Food Program, now Cindy McCain, but now uh, Catholic Relief Services. They're on the ground. Yeah. And, and they should be taking over the responsibilities of, of UNRWA. Well, I, I, my only observation on that is, is I don't have a lot of confidence in NGOs after what I've been seeing down on the southern border. But 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 moving on just for the sake of time, um, you know, and I'm going to skip a couple things that I wanted to cover. But um, one general question for you, Mr. McCall, which may not be fair to you uh, versus another member. And I want to be careful in the way I ask this for purposes of national security and everything else. But how would we characterize America's relative within an, uh, a, a, a publicly available to talk about non-classified way, if it's possible and it may not be, relative uh, uh, stockpile of munitions from to, well, today, from where we were, say, in March of 2022, two years ago, before we were engaging in support for Israel, uh, for uh, Ukraine, well, Israel too, but for Ukraine, um, and, and, and you, know, you, you know, again, within the parameters of what we can publicly talk about. Yeah. And I don't have the exact numbers, but what I'll tell you is what we have, what we have put into Ukraine are, are older, uh, the old weapons, uh, old stockpiles that were sitting around, um, you know, um, and, and what the, this 80 percent, again, of this uh, funding goes to our own defense industrial base to modernize and update uh, our defense industrial base. And, and produce new weapons that are, are better. We're, we're giving them old stuff. And, you know, uh, Eastern Europe's given all the, the old Russian equipment that they have. So they're getting the older things. We want to build the newer and better and modernized weapons. Well, and the, the, we're going to put a lot of money into – this map shows a pretty good – where all this is going to go to states uh, to provide a lot of jobs. I have to say, um, Mr. Roy, you're my friend from Texas, that – we have a defense industrial base problem. Yeah, and we, I, I, I concur. And, and it, 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 it's 100%. a national security problem. And, 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 and that's the thing I like about the bills. We put eight, we put eight percent of it to fixing that defense industrial base that I believe is broken. Well, uh, you know, I, I, with what uh, did you have, uh, Chairman Cole? Yeah, to uh, Chairman McCall's point and your very very good question. Um, Enormous percentage of this uh, is replenishment. I mean, well over $23, 24000000000 billion. At the same time, and one of the areas, I want to be very careful how I say right. this, but uh, let's just take an item like 155 millimeter shell, okay? Um, what we've done so far has more than doubled the capacity of the United States to produce those shells. And what will happen in this supplemental, and, I, and this is, you know, from defense subcommittee work, will more than double it again. So, um, and, and Chairman McCall is exactly right. I mean, what we, norm, my my district has uh, uh, air defense artillery in it at Fort Sill, and we trained a lot of the Ukrainians that are using the Patriot, but they were training on older weapon systems. And, there's four different varieties of these. They were paying on ones and twos. We're buying third and four. So there is, you know, a real effort to increase the capacity to produce, maintain the stockpiles that we need, and again, move the older stuff out, which is still better than anything they had available to them. Uh, but I don't know if was that's it, helpful at all, but I just wanted to share that. It, no, it is. For uh, one second. Yeah, uh, yes, ma'am. Just on that issue, because I, I've, I've asked that question. This is a DOD estimate that at least $50 billion of the package is for the U.S. defense industrial base across 30 states. So, uh, and that is, yeah. uh, that's what DOD is estimating. Well, this and I think the gentlelady, and there's some of these things that we can't get into detail here in a public exactly. setting, and, I, and I'm uh, aware of that. And I, I wanted to bring that out for a number of reasons, because there's a lot of, and, and everybody's guilty of it, there's a lot of sort of painting with a broad brushstroke of why people are concerned with, oppose, or otherwise, where they land on, on certain of these, these issues. One can be, as I would characterize myself as, uh, fully supportive of wanting to fund Israel, um, fully cognizant of the dangers of not 
holding the line against Putin, um, but still be uh, adamant of our need to secure our own border, differences of opinion aside about how, but, but having failed to do so, and, and simultaneously concerned of whether or not we're going to be able to succeed in Ukraine and how the money has been previously spent. So even here today in the testimony, we have heard but in a positive, I think, um, posturing by the chairman, I think, of saying we're going to try to release and force the administration to provide um, at least certain weapons that might help them win it, uh, you know, and be a more aggressive on that front. But meanwhile, a lot of my constituents are going, well, wait, we had $113 billion, um, and, and some of that's been allocated, and I get, get there's different ways to frame those dollars, um, that was already put forward and appropriated, and you're saying, well, okay, how was that spent? And so now we're trying to say, well, if Ukraine needs more in order to, what, hold the line, and to be clear, I don't have a clear mission out of this administration. I don't know whether we're talking about the 1991 lines. I don't know whether we're talking about, you know, every inch of Crimea, every inch of Donbass. I don't know whether we're talking about, well, we're trying to buy time to hold the line on the western edge of the, of the, of the front and, you know, east of, of Kiev to try to prevent them from coming to Kiev, but then have a serious discussion and a ceasefire about the territories that's already been uh, disputed and gained by Russia. I don't have the foggiest clue of what our administration's position and posture is on that with clarity, because we have gotten different views out of the administration on that. There has been you know, kind of the lean into what Mr. Zelensky wants and, and, and say, we want, you know, 1991, we want every every inch of the territory. And then there's been more, well, we just want to make sure we can hold the line and don't let them advance because we don't want them to get anywhere near the western side of Ukraine and therefore be right on the line with Poland and our friends there. And, yeah. and look, I've, I'm not nearly as traveled as the chairman because of my committee's jurisdiction don't take me there. But one of my earliest trips was when I was Senator Cruz's chief of staff. I went on a trip to uh, over a week to Jerusalem, Poland, Estonia, and Kiev. <laughs> I'd say Kiev because when I went there, that's how we said it, <laughs> Kiev now, um, and and w was very steeped in what they face. And I just I just think it's really important for the entire world to understand the dynamic of the dispute at the moment. That it's not some monolithic uh, isolationists who don't want to support our uh, role in the world to pre pre prevent a Putin and to stand for democracy. Uh, but it is a, a real and reasoned debate about priorities when, <clears throat> if you look at during Reagan's time, when you look at the relative debt to GDP ratio under Reagan, right, when we were probably at about a 37%-ish when he did the buildup in the early 80s of our debt to GDP. Today we're now buck 10, buck 20, depending on how you count the debt. And we, so we're in a real problem. And when you look at the overall defense spending, so we've talked here just now about ramping up the defense industrial base on the back of Ukraine. That might be a good thing for our country to get our production level up. Um, but at what cost over there? Will we win? Is there a mission that's achievable here? How many Ukrainians have to die, depending on how we get there in, in the process, which is a very real concern. I think the gentlelady's point was in kind of the, the negative. The ranking uh, member uh, was hey, how many Ukrainians have to die before we act? Some of us are saying, I think, at least with some reason debate, like, I want to help you. How many Ukrainians have to die while this perpetuates without a will to go make sure we win it? How many Ukrainians are dying right now because we're funding it without a very clear authoritative path to victory to ensure that we're going to get it done? So I think those are questions that some of us are wrestling with vis-a-vis -vis this administration, how much money we should then fund, fund into that, and then, meanwhile, our border is being wide open with Chinese foreign nationals coming across the border and so forth. And a, a last point <clears throat> about this, about how we fund war. There's been a lot of discussions in the think tank world, which is only halfway relevant, really, generally speaking, uh, about, you know, what you might call the ghost budgeting, right? Since, since basically September 11th, we have been funding effectively endless conflicts of various sorts. And people say that in a, in a pejorative sense. I don't even mean it that way. There have been very reasoned and important engagements that we have been carrying out. But we've been doing that with OCO. We've been doing that with budget uh, line items with supplemental spending like we're doing now. Whereas prior to September 11th, we were forcing sacrifice among the American people to say, okay, if your blood and or your treasure are going to be sent into battle, that you have to sacrifice. There's going to be increased taxes. There's going to be war bonds. 
There's going to be, uh, you know, you're going to stop buying sugar. You're going to stop buying tires. You're going to start, you're going to, you're going to have something that you're going to have a stake in that as a country. And we have not been doing that. We've literally done nothing but borrow money to fund conflict for the last 25 years. That, I believe, is a fundamental problem and disconnect here. So to the concern that I have here is that plus border equals problem with the rule. Last point I'll make, and then I'll, I'll yield back for purposes of time, is this notion of, of this being kind of an open process, and with all due respect to the former chairman and the current chairman of appropriations, and I hear what he's saying. But, but in truth, for the average American to understand, what we've got now, I think to the uh, approval of our Democratic colleagues, is effectively the Senate bill broken into some pieces, uh, put down on the floor, yes, with some possible amendments, largely all predetermined and pre-cooked, and it's going to be what we call MERV, that's a weird inside the beltway term, for smashing it back together. They're going to be put back together to send over to the Senate in roughly the structure of the Senate bill. This is why we know, and the reporting confirms, that Senator Schumer uh, and to some degree uh, Leader Jeffries have all applauded that this is the result that they want. The reason President Biden yesterday was saying that he's applauding it is it's the result the president <laughs> wants. This is to achieve the objective of effectively the Senate bill from 65 days ago. Therefore, that is why some of us have strong reservation, uh, and more than strong reservation, but objection. Because this is not putting Ukraine on the floor <coughs> for a week of full, unfettered debate like we're having here. I, this is a good conversation. The, the panel has laid out, I think, a whole lot of really important points about what we need to do as a country. Um, but what we've done is decided, and we've decided it in the way we typically do, without the full-throated debate I think you should have on the floor on independent bills, or if you're going to package it together, then last point I'll make is you should honor the um, commitments that you make, and with all due respect uh, to the speaker, when the speaker said, for example, on November 5th, 2023, we can do all these things together, but when you couple Ukraine and the border, that makes sense to people. Or when the speaker says on December 5th, 2023, I explained that supplemental Ukraine funding is dependent upon enactment of transformative change to our nation's border security laws. Or when the speaker said on December 12th, 2023, from the very beginning when I handed the gavel, we needed clarity on what we're doing in Ukraine and how we'll have proper oversight of the spending of precious taxpayer dollars, and we needed transformative change at the border. Or as the speaker said at the border, down in Texas in January, Quote, I told the president that I've been saying for many months, and that is we must have change at the border, substantive policy change. I could go on and on. I won't. This is where the people that I represent fall, and that is why I have strong reservations and concerns and, and don't believe that I support the rule. The gentleman has been wanting to talk, and I'll, I'll, I'll certainly yeah, I, yield to the gentleman. I gentlemen. appreciate gentlemen yielding, and I, and, and, and I thank you. And I, I just to the point of clarification, because there's been a lot of discussion about the border. Um, but when there was a bipartisan uh, agreement overall, and, and the border piece uh, was, was a part of that, when, and this was at, quite afterward, when the, the former president indicated his um, uh, opposition uh, uh, to the bill, and then it fell apart, and we were no longer going to have any border piece of it. I just think it's important to note because we keep making reference to border security, okay? Uh, this was Division B, border security and combating fentanyl supplemental appropriations, 2024. And uh, I, I, you know, I, I, I don't have time here for the committee to, to read what was then uh, uh, excised and what the Republicans have walked away from what was in this a, a portion of, of the bill in terms of border security. Uh, in the, the criminal division, uh, combating human trafficking and smuggling that affect U.S. border communities. This is the Texas communities that we're talking about. Uh, yes, uh, uh, additional immigration uh, 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 teams. Marshal services, federal prison detention, Drug Enforcement Administration, U.S. Customs and Border Protection, U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, um, uh, uh, federal law enforcement training centers. I, I, I'm not reading it all because it's just too much. Um, uh, uh, there was efforts on the unaccompanied children uh, 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 program. 
um, USCIS direct hire authority, ICE direct hire authority, um, uh, 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 supplemental commissioner authority and de definitions, <coughs> training for U.S. Border Patrol, electronic not uh, notices to appear. Uh, it, 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 goes, yeah. it goes on. Um, uh, I, 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 again, th there was substantial approval in a bipartisan way on border security measures. And when the former president made his determination and said, this is not something we want to provide a win for. I think the American public needs not just to hear border security, but I think the American public has got to understand where the Republicans have uh, really walked back on border security by saying no to this. You can just continue to use that phrase and, uh, uh, and, 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 and the pejorative way, but not talk about what it is that was relinquished in terms of getting control of the border. And I am someone who believes that we do have to have border security well, and get control and, of the border. And I, I appreciate that. I want to give the, the chairman time to sure. speak, and I want to be able to get my time back. But the chairman, the chairman wanted to, to, to engage. Yeah, just quickly to add a couple of things, and uh, I, I didn't particularly want to be drawn into the border discussion, <laughs> but I will add this. Uh, it does matter how you arrive at a deal. We produced H.R. 2 through a normal committee process. People got their fingers on it. They negotiated. They fought. They came to a product. They moved the product not only out of committee but across the floor. With all due respect to our friends in the Senate, that's not what happened there. Yeah. I, I actually don't think it's fair to say there was a bipartisan deal. There was a bill deal between three senators. Right. And when Seven you know votes. one side looked, at, these are friends of mine. I'm yeah. not critical of anybody. But of the that. process that was set up, it, it would have yeah. been better if they'd have done. They don't have to take what we do. They've been better off to take what we did and change it however they want in a normal committee. That's how people come to deals. And the Senate has moved away from that, and I, I regret that. Uh, but, I, you know, all that aside, I think my friend made so many good points about the concerns that all of us have about the conduct of the conflict in Ukraine. I don't. I can hardly think of anything that you said that I disagree with. I worry about the lack of defined objectives. I worry about the open strategy. I will tell you this, and I will say this, um, maybe not in defense, but in explanation of the administration. We had a defense subcommittee hearing on appropriations uh, uh, several months ago, may, may have even been late last year where these questions were raised. And we had an assistant secretary of state for international security, director of operations for the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Uh, and I, uh, the secretary or assistant secretary for international security made the point. She said, look, the objective is probably it needs to be obvious that what Russia did was a strategic failure. Uh, and so that nobody does anything like this again. And this was ahead of the counteroffensive, which did not go as well as we would have hoped. I think that's fair to say, uh, or Ukraine would have hoped. Uh, and she said, that may well impact how you define that. Now, I look at it, and I can say to this point, Russia has pushed Finland and Sweden into NATO. I guarantee you that's not something they wanted to do. To this point, they've suffered over 300,000 casualties. That's not something they planned on or wanted to do. To this point, uh, they've been forced into measures they thought they would never have to take. They, they thought this would be a war that was over in weeks, not many months now into its third year in some way. But now I give the Ukrainians most credit at all. They're doing the fighting and dying. Now, we've been pretty indispensable to that effort. Right. So have our friends in Europe who've provided enormous amounts. I've never seen them step up like this. And there are a dozen countries who have actually committed a larger percentage of their GDP and a larger percentage of their, their budgets than us. And that's their credit. They're closer. You know, and I get one. If you're from Poland or you're from the Baltic states, you're from, you know, you look at this a little bit differently than we do because you don't have the luxury of distance and the relative security of the United States. 
So I do think this is evolving. I do think, uh, you know, however anybody votes on it, I, look, I really respect the different points of view in the Congress on this. And I'm very careful about not calling people that oppose Ukraine isolationists because they aren't. Most of them support Israel. Most of them uh, support what we're trying to do in the Western Pacific. How can you be an isolationist mm -hmm. if that's it? They've got a problem about how this war is being conducted, the nature of our commitment, the lack of strategy. There are, I will say this, in the legislation we have, and I'm not going to tell you I'm 100 percent satisfied with it because I'm not, but there are, there's a lot more oversight requirements than there ever were in the Senate bill. There is a requirement that they produce a strategy. Whether they do or not, as you know, you've been around here a while, too, as both a staff and a member. Just because we tell them to do something doesn't mean an administration of either side always do what we tell them to do. But uh, there, there is more in that. And I will say this. This is not the package the Senate wanted. They sent us what they wanted. <laughs> They're getting back something different. Now, my friends made the <clears throat> points, which I agree with, that financially, this is broadly the same thing. But it is brought in components where people can vote individually how they choose to. And you can make it very apparent, I'm not for this, but I am for this. Or you can be against it all. Uh, and, uh, you know, but the body will work its will. Individual members will get to vote how they want to. If you support Israel, you won't uh, have to vote for Ukraine. And on the other side of, uh, of the aisle, you know, some of my friends are very skeptical about the Israeli aid component, would like to attach a lot of conditions to it, do stuff like that. Uh, and, but we're not going to force them to vote for Israeli aid because they were for Ukrainian aid. You know, that, that I think is a big difference. And it's also going to force the Senate, uh, you know, again, to accept some measure we want. Is it perfect? No. But to my friend, the ranking member on appropriations point, it's governing. It's a compromise. It's, it's kind of the best we could do in the time frame that we have. But that doesn't take anything away from the legitimacy. My friend from Texas points are about the process and honestly about some of his concerns, because I share some of those very same concerns, uh, about the manner in which the administration has conducted the war. I think those are fair things to point out. I would just, again, say we are at a critical point. I kind of look at this in for a penny, in for a pound. Uh, I do not want to leave an ally high and dry. And frankly, I don't want to see happen in Ukraine what, this, what happened in Afghanistan. I do not want to see that kind of situation unfold. I think it's a terrible message for the rest of the world. I think what happened in Afghanistan was a terrible message to the rest of the world. I think that's one of the reasons why we're here right now. So with that, I, I, so, that's a long time. I, I, well, I appreciate if, if I could, I'm going to. I don't want to cut off any of the panelists. I'm not trying to. But I've, on, on my time, the panel has gone a, a while, so I want to be able to yield back to the chairman. But but I have to make one response to the to the ranking member, and then I, I want to yield back, mm -hmm. and that is on the border issues. Right. Um, the 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 bill, the package bill, um, would have uh, demonstrably codified the uh, mass release of individuals by its own wording. Uh, it was structured in such a way to set a constant flow of individuals into the United States, and notwithstanding all of the funding uh, mechanisms that the gentlelady uh, outlined, that is funding that would have been used predominantly to continue the processing and the flow of the mass abuse of both parole and asylum to flood more people into the country, which has resulted very demonstrably in individuals being in the country who are dangerous and attached to terrorist organizations and criminals that have then resulted in the death of Americans, very specifically. And so, and then I'll, I'll conclude by saying um, I very much take to heart and appreciate the uh, chairman's comments, uh, Mr. Cole, um, and, and the entire panel. I, I appreciate the, the dialogue. Um, I am well aware of the, of the considerations involving Ukraine and the prospects of what occurs if Ukraine falls. I believe we should have handled this differently with the $113 billion we've already spent. Um, I am sympathetic to potentially additional dollars if it were, in my view, more targeted and more lethal. And if we were honoring, and this is the backbreaker for me, the commitment that we, at least as Republicans, have made to our constituents to secure the border of the United States first. For that reason, 
I have to remain opposed. And uh, we will we will continue to have this conversation. I have great respect. Is I just want clarity? us to clear. I'm, I'm going to. We've done enough time. I'm sorry. Clarity I, I'm sorry, coming I'm out of the gonna, of I'm going to yield, yield, yield back to the chair. We have covered back no the clarity. The gentleman does yield back. Uh, chair recognizes the lady from Indiana. Thank you. Um, I I don't have a lot of questions. I do have a few. Uh, thank you for your uh, indulgence on the time. Um, one of the things that that we hear or that I have heard in some, from some constituents back home is that we are in this bill package funding um, other countries and wars in other countries and we, we're not funding our own border. The question that I have though is, is this a funding problem? Is this a money problem or is it a policy problem? Because for me, I don't think that's a, it's not a binary choice for me between the funding border or funding the, the efforts that we're trying in Israel and Ukraine and in, in, in Taiwan in particular. The policy is what's failing at the southern border. And we've tried to pass HR2, our own border bill. Um, we have called on the president to act under his executive power, which we know he can do, uh, because when he first took office, he undid an executive order uh, that President Trump had instituted uh, on day one. So is this a funding problem relative to the border, or is it a policy problem? I'll go to Chairman Turner. Uh, McCall. Or, sorry, McCall. I'm so sorry. <laughs> they get the mics right. mixed they up do. every they now do. and then. Yeah. There are three of us. Yeah, they, they get the blondes mixed up, too. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's it's a policy problem. I, I would say it's an enfor on the border. It's not enforcing existing law. So take remain in Mexico, for instance. I marked that up out of my committee. It was part of HR two. Uh, President day one on office rescinded that policy, which the head of border patrol told me Ortiz had a direct cause and effect on what's happening in the southern border. Now money's not going to change that. Mm -hmm. It's, it's the asylum policy changes that were made that are, have caused this problem. And we can pass it again, but it's not, a, it's not even a legislative problem. It's an enforcement mm -hmm. problem. He already has the, the authorities to secure the border, just like President Trump did. Mm -hmm. But he, he chooses not to do it. I think he wants cover to have a bipartisan bill to say, oh, okay, now I'm fixing the border when he's, he's already chosen not to. Uh, Mayorkas is not enforcing the laws down there, letting aggravated felons, releasing them, even though the law says shall detain. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's hugely an enforcement issue. Um, and we can pass it again, but if he doesn't enforce it, it doesn't do any good. And, and so funding issue, um, throw more money if you don't have a policy change, won't do any good. And to your point, um, remain in Mexico. Just let's just take that single policy point. Um, what would Border Patrol say? Uh, how how much could we cut back on illegal crossings just by reinstating remain in Mexico? I, I would say uh, the majority. Uh, it, it does two things. Remain in Mexico. When you're apprehended, you are you have to. You go to Mexico where you remain. You're not released into the United States. You have to remain pending the adjudication of your asylum claim. Political asylum claims, about 85% are not legit. 15% are. But since they're not in the United States, they're not released into the United States. So it's very simple, mm -hmm. you know, concept. Um, and um, when that policy was changed, they knew it's also a messaging deterrent thing. Mm -hmm. We're sending the wrong message that, hey, if you come, you can stay. Remember when Marcus says, well, you, you can come, just don't come now, he says. Mm. What kind of message does that send to people that want to come? More importantly, what does that send to the cartels? Mm. Because they're, they're the one profiting, making the money off these victims that they traffic up in the United States and the fentanyls and everything else. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a serious national security threat. I appreciate Chip's comments. I agree with most of them. Um, I wish, uh, you know, but if the president's not going to enforce the law, 
then we that's what elections are for. Right. We pass it. We can pass all the laws we want if the president will not and Mayorkas will not enforce the law. Right. Then there's not much we can do. We've already impeached Mayorkas yeah. for his failure to follow the law. Correct. Um, thank you for that. And then um, this question it was it was brought up by my my um, friend from Texas, Mr. Roy. The comments that the speaker has made relative to, you know, having border and, and Ukraine tied together. I would say to um, Chairman McCall, what has changed in Ukraine and Israel and relative to Taiwan that you can talk about? What has changed since the speaker has made those statements? Has the situation become, has something changed to make the situation become di more dire? In those uh, since areas. he made what, which statement? Since he said um, that any funding for Ukraine would have to be tied to the border. Well, all I can tell you, I can give you the, um, the very quick overview that the chairman will allow. I mean, uh, the situation is very dire in Ukraine. I just talked to our ambassador. Uh, Kharkiv is about ready to fall. That's about 2 million people, civilian, you know, innocent civilians. If you have any human compassion, uh, children being slaughtered and abducted, kidnapped, sent to Russia, uh, maternity hospitals bombed. But the car key is going to fall if this doesn't pass. And then the power grid is going to go out. They have, I would give them two weeks to a month before the Russians will take over Ukraine. What are the consequences of that consequences to, to the United very, States? Well, what were the consequences from Afghanistan? Mm -hmm. When Afghanistan imploded and we surrendered to the Taliban, it sent a message of weakness. And then now we're going to surrender to Putin in Ukraine, an, you know, an adversary. Uh, and then it goes beyond Ukraine. There's no question every military intelligence expert I talk to, foreign policy expert, that he's going to go beyond Ukraine. He's going to go into Moldova. They're not protected under Article 5. He'll go into Georgia. That's low-hanging fruit. Then he's going to start probing the Baltics. Poland is extremely nervous right now. And I don't blame him, given the history. When you go to Poland today, they say, this is like 1939. Mm -hmm. oh, they, they remember the Nazis coming in, and the United States was not engaged. You know, my dad was in that war. Mm -hmm. And they, we lost a lot of men and women. And you, you wonder if we had deterrence. You know, like Chamberlain was not deterrent. Churchill was. And you have to ask yourself at this moment, who are you? And, uh, you know, we could have maybe stopped that war earlier had we provided the earlier deterrence. And that's what we're trying to do. If we don't give them what they need to win, then we may very well get dragged into this. Mm -hmm. And that's the last thing I want to see happen to uh, our young men and women. It's interesting when America doesn't lead on the world stage uh, with foreign policy, uh, I believe that's what has led us here today. I think we had a lack of leadership. We certainly had terrible um, foreign policy decisions with respect to Afghanistan. Um, but we have weak leadership right now in the White House, which has led us, I think, to where we are. But I do think that um, you know the United States has been a beacon of freedom mm -hmm. and liberty and democracy uh, and um, we do have to seriously consider, uh, and I'm glad that we are today, all of this, these, all of these bills with respect to what that says to um, the rest of the world. And that's why we, I called it the peace through strength mm -hmm. bill, because I, I, that was Reagan's quote, but it was Churchill's axiom. It was, you know, it, when we project strength, uh, we get peace. If we project weakness, we get conflict, aggression, and war. And that's what we're seeing. Why all of a sudden are we seeing this? I mean, I would say after Afghanistan, then you're seeing the, the Russian Federation and, and Ukraine. You're seeing the threat to Taiwan from China getting very aggressive. She is watching what's happening in Ukraine. If Ukraine falls, then Chairman Xi ha has that opening. Mm -hmm. Then he knows that the resolve is not there by the U.S. Congress or this weak president. And he's going to invade Taiwan. Ninety percent of the advanced semiconductors are manufactured in Taiwan. Think about that. And then, of course, we know what's going on in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. The Ayatollah has been empowered by Russia, who buys their missiles and 
and and China that buys $80 billion in energy that this administration has not enforced the sanctions on. Mm -hmm. They're all tied together, by the way. I got a great picture. If you don't have the, you know, we wrote uh, uh, Turner and uh, Armed Services and House Intelligence and and Foreign Affairs wrote a uh, a path to victory, and we have a picture of the Ayatollah, you know, and Putin and Chairman Xi together. They're all in this together. Mm -hmm. Finally, I guess I would ask, um, when we're considering this bill package in particular, um, is there uh, funding included to restock our own ammunition for the United States, to take care of our own to restocking of supplies? So that would be something that, that is something that the United States very much would need us to do to be prepared for whatever conflict is yet to come. So 80 percent of the Ukraine portion of this goes into replenishing and modernizing our defense industrial base. Uh, uh, Chairman Cole talked about he's got everybody, most of us have contractors, and we need to fix our defense industrial base. This is a problem with or without the Ukraine conflict. And the fact that 80 percent goes into that, I think the American people need to understand that. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it is going into our own production of our defenses, uh, which is is – Somewhat broken. It's necessary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Gentlelady yields back, Chair. Thanks, the gentlelady, and the gentleman from Georgia is recognized for his questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And before I get going, let me say this: I've been here since ten o'clock this morning, and the only person I intend to yield back to is you, Mr. <laughs> Chair. But I'm going to be. I'm going to just make a couple of statements. Um, for the last three hours, we've had a lot of discussion about which U.S. president is responsible for. The invasion. Let me make something clear. Vladimir Putin is responsible for the invasion. And when we go to that floor as the U.S. Congress, I think it's a mistake for us to make disparaging remarks about the current or the previous president and the person that I will think will be sworn in at the end of or beginning of next year is the next president. Vladimir Putin is the reason for the invasion of Ukraine. Vladimir Putin is the reason for this war, not President Trump, not President Biden. Um, with regard to uh, the Repo Act, Russia has already seized the assets of other companies and corporations, and they're going to continue to seize the assets of other companies and corporations, whether the Repo Act is passed or not. If you read the language on the Repo Act, there's approximately $5 billion that the U.S. could actually uh, attach to. It's a very small portion of what Russia actually has, and the majority of the money is in Belgium, and Belgium has said that they will not in, uh, enforce the Repo Act unless there's an agreement of the G7. So there are certain protections that have been built into the bill that have not been discussed. Uh, with regard to Putin's intentions, uh, he intends to control the Black Sea. If he controls the Black Sea, he has tremendous control over the global food supply. I think that everybody needs to be paying very close attention to that. I mean, we learned real quick, those who didn't know just how valuable uh, the port of Odessa in Ukraine is to the, the global food supply. Fortunately, that has been uh, a lot of that has been turned back on because of what the Ukrainians have been able to do in pushing the Russian naval fleet out of Crimea and and back to the eastern portion of the Black Sea. Uh, he's already across the border in Moldova. That does not get talked about much. Moldova does not have a military and does not have the ability to protect themselves. And he's already across the border in Georgia. So. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield whatever hours upon hours I had left of time to you. Chair, thanks, the gentleman from Georgia. You're very generous. Uh, I want to thank our panel. It's very thought provoking, very thoughtful uh, comments that you've made. Uh, this, these witnesses are excused. Uh, Mr. Chairman, can I enter into the record a statement on behalf of Ms. Wagner's Amendment 2? Senate passed the Radiation Exposure Compensation Reauthorization Act to compensate Americans harmed by our nuclear weapons here, development uh, program. Here, I urge the committee to consider this amendment. Subject is ordered. Thank you. Again, the witnesses are, are excused. Thank you. And now as we <laughs> undertake the transition, I would like to invite Mr. Clyde, Mr. Nels, Mr. Mast, Mr. Boylan, Mr. Zinke, Dr. Nunn, and Mr. Norman.
best speech of the whole day. <laughs> McCall, I will never yield to you. You are run DMC, brother. You talk too much. Ask, uh, ask departing, de departing witnesses to leave and arriving witnesses to be seated. Mr. McCall, stop filibustering. You're jeopardizing passage of your bill. Welcome to each of you. We would welcome your <laughs> being be in order. Uh, welcome all of our witnesses. Uh, do be mindful of the fact that we've already spent a good number of hours on this. We've got a good number of hours to go. So please summarize your amendments, and then we'll take questions. We'll start with Mr. Clyde. Well, thank you, thank you, Chairman. Um, First, I would like to um, uh, speak in favor of my amendment number 43 and number 45 to H.R. 8034, the Israel Security Supplemental Appropriations Act. All right. Is that better? Okay. Um, these two critical amendments will allow Israel to receive the necessary small arms that they need. I have been extremely concerned about the Department of State's lack of transparency regarding the issue of export licenses to, for the direct commercial sales of small arms to the Israeli National Police who are in acute need of them. Shortly after Hamas's brutal terrorist attack on October 7th, 2023, Israel contracted with U.S. small arms manufacturers to purchase rifles that they desperately needed. These small arms contracts were approved by Congress back in November and are being purposefully delayed by the Department of State for what I believe are political reasons. What normally would be a 41-day process of approval has now been languishing for over six months. To date, the Department of State has not provided a valid reason for delaying these export licenses. The Department of State says it is concerned that the rifles will be used by settlers against the Palestinians. Well, the rifles are going to the national police, which is part of the Israeli government, not to settlers. So this excuse is entirely unacceptable, in my opinion. You know, there was also a joint letter by the chairman of House Foreign Affairs, Mr. McCall, who just testified here, um, and the chairman of Appropriations, uh, State, and Foreign Operations, um, subcommittee Chair Mr. D.S. Bellark uh, to the Department of State asking them to approve these export licenses. Um, so th it is very concerning uh, that the Department of State has delayed these. So my amendments are in line with the letter from these two uh, chairmen and would ensure that these licenses are swiftly approved and, the, and ensure that Israel gets the small arms they need as soon as possible in order to defend itself and continue to defend itself against terrorism. And I urge the Rules Committee to make these amendments in order so that we can show additional support to Israel. Um, <clears throat> also, I have an amendment uh, regarding the international disaster assistance. I'm here today to speak in favor of Amendment Number 67 to H.R. 8034, the Israel S Supplemental Security Appropriations Act. My amendment would strike over $5.5 billion for international disaster assistance. This money is part of the over $9 billion in this legislation for humanitarian assistance, and this language is almost identical uh, to what was included in the Senate National Security Supplemental, which passed the Senate earlier this year. Um, in, this, in, in a Senate Democrat press release, they explained that these funds that are in this bill for disaster assistance are to provide food, water, shelter, medical care, and other essential services to civilians in Gaza. Well, why in the world are we giving billions of dollars in an Israel support supplemental to Gaza, especially when this assistance will end up in the hands of and embolden Hamas terrorists? It has been reported that USAID funds have ended up in the hands of Hamas. Our own oversight committee sent a letter to USAID expressing their concern about USAID money potentially going to Hamas. You know, when you provide these type of services to Gaza, uh, you provide the same aid to Hamas terrorists in Gaza. When you feed one person, you feed another as well. And you allow all the money 
that would normally that they would normally spend on these type of services to go to weapons production, ammunition production, and uh, literally fighting Israel. So we must support our greatest ally in the Middle East, Israel, and not Hamas. My amendment would strip this funding provision and ensure that we are not inadvertently supporting Hamas terrorists. And my third amendment, or, or my third set of remarks, are on the economic, on the Ukraine economic loan forgiveness. Mr. Chairman, um, <clears throat> my amendments to H.R. 8035, the Ukraine Supplemental Appropriations Act of 2024, would provide, <clears throat> uh, would show that this bill provides billions of dollars of economic assistance to the country of Ukraine in the form of a loan, and additionally provides that the president explicit authority to waive any Ukrainian debt that comes from these loans. My First Amendment, number 71, would strip the president's authority to waive the Ukrainian debt. If you borrow money from another person, you should be required to pay it back the loan, especially when that loan is coming from the hardworking American taxpayers that all of us represent. The House Republican majority has rightfully fought President Biden's student loan forgiveness scheme every step of the way. Therefore, it makes absolutely no sense for us to turn our back on the American people now and provide the ability to forgive another country's debt instead. Simply put, the American taxpayer should not be on the hook for economic assistance to foreign citizens when millions of Americans across the country are still struggling to afford basic necessities such as groceries, gas, rent, or mortgage payments under President Biden's inflationary economy. This loan forgiveness that does not benefit the American taxpayer one bit would instead add fuel to the inflationary fire already ravaging the wallets of taxpaying Americans. At the very least, Congress must vote on the authority provided to the president in the bill to waive Ukraine's loan. Therefore, my second amendment, Clyde number 69, submitted to this bill would amend the mechanism to the debt waiver to require a joint resolution of approval to be passed by both houses of Congress rather than a joint resolution of disapproval before any debt waiver from the president can be implemented. This amendment is a common sense solution that ensures Congress does not cede any more power to an overly powerful executive branch, and it ensures that Congress has the final say on any debt waiver, not the president, so Congress can stay directly accountable to the American people with regard to this funding. Thank you again for letting me testify, and I look forward to your questions. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Clyde. Um, I have Mr. Nels next on the list. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I I think my amendment kind of addresses your concerns about this humanitarian aid, and it's quite clear. It's pretty simple. I, I, I read this report. I look at this bill with Israel here. It's, it's obviously, it's 25 pages. Gaza's name is used 11 times, 11 times. The bill, the bill is about Israel, but yet... When you take a deep dive into this, and I spent the last two hours listening to this committee talk, and finally Meeks just kind of said it, nine billions going to Gaza. Nine billions going to Gaza. Well, if we wanted nine billion to go to Gaza, why don't we have a standalone bill for Gaza? Why, are to, to me, you're kind of confusing members of Congress and, and, in my humble opinion, the American people by coming up with a bill, making it sound like we are really, really here to support Israel. Well, it's not. So my amendment goes in there on page 11, states 5.65 5 billion international disaster assistance to address humanitarian needs. That's going to Gaza, I can assure you. The migration and refugee assistance heading 3.49 billion, that's going to Gaza. And it was unclear to me when I read this. I had to get lawyers to kind of go in there and read between the lines. And I said, I think this money's going to Gaza. Even though it's an Israeli bill, it's for Israel. And I said to myself, when you put your hat on, you think about it, you say, I know what happened. I think the squad wrote page 11. I think the squad got in there and wrote page 11 because this administration is, they ain't got this figured out. They're trying to play both sides. They're trying to support Israel, but yet he better do something about the pro-Palestinians that are already protesting every day. Oh, and by the way, when you have a primary in Michigan and one out of every five voters are saying, I'm not committed or I'm not even voting for Joe Biden 
To me, this bill is nothing more than election interference when you want to put $9 billion for Gaza. He's playing both sides, and he's using the American tax dollars to leverage it. I, I don't understand how we could support any legislation that is meant to support our greatest ally, Israel, but yet we're going to give $9 billion to Gaza. So I would appreciate everyone's support on my amendment that will insert after humanitarian needs the following with respect to Israel. The money needs to be sent to Israel. Mr. Massey brought it up. He asked the questions. He said, this is going to Gaza. Well, if you want to send $9 billion to Gaza, there should be a standalone bill on Gaza and not try to insert that stuff into this bill uh, that supports Israel. And that's what it was titled, Appropriation Bills for Israel. Shame on this for what we've done today. I yield. Sure. Thanks, the gentleman. The gentleman yields back. Mr. Mast, you're next on my list. Yeah. Maybe. There we go. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I mean, I guess I'd start by saying this to, to this committee. Anybody in here want to disagree with me that Israel is our ally? They're our ally. I don't see anybody disagreeing. Anybody in here want to say that Gaza is our ally? I even see heads shaking no. Let the record state, nobody in here is saying that Gaza is our ally. I'll even wait another moment to see if anybody wants to say yes. There's no yes. It makes absolutely no sense, as my colleague was just pointing out, that we support our non-ally who is at war with our ally. In, in any sense, does that make In any world, does that make sense? It doesn't. Um, so I want to talk about four amendments here. Uh, all related to this. Number one, uh, number 22, number 23, number 24, and number 62. Uh, so number 22, under elimination. The underlying text of this bill has already purported not to allow funds to go to UNRWA, but in this bill, I think it's important that we go further to work to eliminate UNRWA and uh, make it known that it is uh, specifically, as it states in this amendment, uh, U.S. policy that UNRWA should be disbanded and directs the president to take actions to achieve that policy, specifically through a couple of ways, coordinating international efforts to achieve the policy of disbanding uh, UNRWA by removing all UNRWA facilities from the United States, by conditioning assistance to foreign countries on them adopting the policy of disbanding UNRWA, and, of course, by prohibiting all U.S. funds from going to UNRWA, uh, like what is also, again, purported in this bill. Uh, it's in the underlying text of this bill not to put funds in there for a reason, because we know that there are serious problems with UNRWA, uh, dating back many, many years just from their constant instruction of Jew hate within the schools uh, that they work in to the participation of UNRWA employees in the October 7 attacks. And again, to go back to that point that nobody in here will say that Gaza is our ally, Let's make the point that UNRWA is essentially 30,000 Palestinians that work for that. So if we're giving funds to UNRWA, giving any resources to UNRWA, we're essentially paying the salary of our non-ally, who again is at war with our allies. So that's my amendment number 22. I seek support in that. Number 23, uh, no funds for supporting a Palestinian state. As we speak, the United Nations is working on voting on recognizing uh, Gaza, the Palestinian people, as a Palestinian state. I'd like to add to this bill through Amendment 20, number 23 uh, that no funds uh, shall be used to support a Palestinian state. Uh, again, we would be looking at a state being created that the United States of America would immediately have to label a state sponsor of terror. That's what would become of a Palestinian-created state. We would have to call it that. Why would we give one dollar, one ounce of support to an entity that we would have to label a state sponsor of terror? I think, it, again, it's very sensical that we work to ensure that that doesn't happen. Moving to amendment number uh, 24, expedite funds to Israel, uh, making sure that from enactment of this bill, uh, should it be enacted, that those funds reach Israel no later than 30 days. Uh, I think it's important. We've seen, unfortunately, uh, very partisan support for Israel. Uh, it dates back to the, the previous conflict of rocket attacks being fired into Israel that the chairman that was brought up before, Chairman Meeks, Foreign Affairs Committee, literally worked 
to hold up arms transfers to Israel in a time that they were working to defend themselves through the Iron Dome system from rocket attacks coming in yet again from Gaza. It's well known that the chairman, ranking member of Foreign Affairs, also uh, armed services, they need to sign off on arms transfers. They were specifically working to not sign off on those so that in a time of war, our ally was essentially being sanctioned. We see a bill where 40 members of the Democrat Party have uh, signed on to not have arms transfers to Israel, essentially asking to sanction our ally against our non-ally who's at war. And uh, that can't take place. We need to ensure that should this pass, those resources get there immediately. Final amendment, uh, number 62, do not build or rebuild Gaza. The American people have absolutely no business putting $1 towards building a port in Gaza, building in Gaza, uh, anything in Gaza. Our resources do not belong uh, building or rebuilding uh, the infrastructure of our non-ally who conducted a genocide against our ally. And in that, I thank the chairman for recognizing me for the time. Gentleman yields back, chair. Thanks, the gentleman. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Moylan, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And today I have five amendments before the Rules Committee amending H.R. 8036, which is the Indo-Pacific Security Supplemental. These amendments are all based on various unfunded requests from components of the Department of Defense within the Indo-Pacific. These amendments have been crafted with security for the people of Guam in mind. My first two amendments are directly based upon U.S. Indo-PACOM's number one unfunded priority. That's the Guam Missile Defense. As the supplemental will address missile defense in Ukraine and Israel, I am compelled to also advocate for additional fundings to protect the American homeland from missile defense threats. The first of these amendments supports the completion of the Guam Missile Defense System, provided, providing my constituents with a 360 degree of coverage from inbound threats. Now, the second of these amendments is to fully fund the procurement needs of this system. And for the third amendment, as much of the Indo-Pacific Supplemental focuses on submarine forces, I ask my colleagues to support my amendment funding critical repairs to the Guam breakwater. This Navy-owned breakwater protects Port of Guam, ensuring it's navigable for the military and civilian vessels alike. This breakwater is one storm away from being destroyed which would not only halt commercial shipping to Guam, but bottle up the five fast attack submarines based in Guam. So I encourage my colleagues to support this amendment for the sake of not only my constituents, but for the sake of the submarine forces in the Western Pacific. As noted, storms are a major issue for the military forces on Guam. And last year, Typhoon Mawar caused an estimated two billion in damage to the military installations on Guam. To get back on track, I, I propose an amendment to provide increased planning and design funding for Typhoon Moir recovery. And finally, in times of crisis, be it a typhoon or a future conflict, the Guam National Guard will be present to protect the people of Guam. My final am amendment supports unfunded priorities for the Guam National Guard. This amendment, like my others, is focused on the security for the Americans who live in the Indo-Pacific and to directly defend American homeland. So I encourage my colleagues to not back down, to support my five amendments, and to directly protect the American homeland and the Indo-Pacific. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Chair, thanks, the gentleman. Gentleman yields back. Mr. Zinke, you're recognized for the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and congratulations on your chair. And I'd like to say a special thanks to all members. Uh, being the Rules Committee is well, not well, easy. gentleman yield. I'm going to ask you to hold your applause till the end of the week, and we'll see how it goes. Well, well, yeah. well my condolences, but I just want to say uh, for, the, for the members, thank you. I know it's an enormous amount of time, but it is important, and, and, and I recognize that. I think most of the members recognize that. Thank you. And uh, this is not in any way a, a promotion for me being on the committee. Uh, I, I offer today an amendment uh, to Israel uh, Security Supplement App uh, Appropriations Act in 2024, uh, reading through it, I know who wrote it. It was Miss Samantha Powell. Uh, it was well written. It mentions U Ukraine. It mentions Gaza. 
but as the ranking member pointed out, it's unknown to that division because that's the way it was written. It's a blank check. It can go anywhere. It can go to Haiti. It can go to most countries. Uh, but what I do know in war is this. War is ugly. But the objective of war is win. And every war I fought over, when we won, it was on the basis of surrender. In Gaza, I would think the war would be won when unconditional surrender and return of hostages. I cannot in good faith aid an enemy before unconditional surrender and return of hostages, although this is an appropriations bill and I don't have the latitude to put that in. What I do have the latitude is to strike it. Because in good faith, I cannot provide aid to the enemy when I don't know how much money is going into it and it's intentionally written to a blank check. But this is what I do know, that any money that goes to Gaza goes to Hamas. And that I do know. And I think this whole member and body knows that. So I'm hoping peace for peace. I'm hoping unconditional surrender. I'm hoping return of the hostages in good faith. Um, but I ask for your support of this amendment because I don't think Congress should be in the business of providing blank checks or aid to our enemies. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield. Sure. Thanks, gentlemen. Thank you. Yields back. Uh, Mr. Nunn, my apologies. I identified you as Dr. Dunn, but Dr. <laughs> Dunn, you're, you're recognized for your Well, Dr. Burgess, it's a privilege. Thank you very much. Thanks again also to the Rules Committee and to the other members who have helped put forward, I think, very meaningful amendments to refine this legislation. Look, we all recognize that America stands at a crossroads right now. Do we protect national security or do we allow our adversaries to take point on the world stage? Not even a week ago, 300 weapon systems were launched with the intent to obliterate our closest ally in the Middle East, Israel. And it wasn't just the Israeli civilians who were in harm's way. It was American colleagues like mine who have flown combat sorties in the region. It was our British, French, and also our Arabic allies, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, who stood up and intercepted it to a 99% efficiency kill rate. Their biggest concern was that the success of last Saturday in the safeguarding of Israel may not ever be able to be replicated because we do not have the weapon systems necessary to be able to do this again. And so what I see as so important in this bill is that we not only resupply but we reaffirm our commitment to our allies. As was highlighted earlier on this committee, the defense of our southern border must always be national security issue number one for the United States. But as we march out also, we must be clear that the terrorist attacks on Israel on the 7th of October drive us forward with six amendments that I'd like to briefly highlight. America must be unwavering in our support to our strongest ally, and that means not only supporting them with technology and weapon systems, but it also means holding the greatest threat actor in the region accountable. Iran action was naked. It is the first time that they've not used just their proxies, but launched a full-scale assault. The sanctions regime against Iran today is largely unmitigated. $80 billion in illicit oil sales going back to fund both the proxies and the exact weapon systems that we saw attack Israel. The drones, the cruise missiles, all a result of a sanction regime that's not been enforced. My amendment would directly require Treasury to hunt down and identify high-value Iranian assets that are helping to fund this and Iran's campaign of terror across the world, including those potentially threatening the United States today. We can either be, as has been highlighted, a Chamberlain or a Churchill when it comes to addressing the threat from Iran. Not acting today would not only be a dereliction of duty, but would continue to put U.S. forces in harm's way, including those three members that we saw who lost their lives just earlier this year. Second, the threat in Europe and around the world is a direct threat, not just from the kinetic strike caused by Russia, but of those who would fill the void, including those coming from China, as was highlighted earlier here, we have to be able to ensure that any dollars going, even through loans, need to ensure that we do not have a Chinese asset that would be able to capitalize on that. That's why my follow amendments here would ensure that no other adversary is able to sh set up shop in either Ukraine, Taiwan, or Israel. Many American businesses have already invested heavily in Ukraine and stand ready to repair that critical infrastructure. What we cannot allow are Chinese entities like Huawei, or ZTE, to be the beneficiaries of assets that were seized from Russia from their attack and then repurposed for the reconstruction of that being done by Chinese manufacturers. 
and this would help prioritize U.S. infrastructure as a key element for rebuilding that country and defending it. Congress has banned Huawei operations in the U.S. In, or in 2019, and we must ensure that no U.S. taxpayer dollar goes forward to pay for a Chinese company having a market advantage in this area. Allowing USAID to fund a Huawei telecommunications infrastructure only emboldens the CCP and would allow China to strategically position itself on NATO's front door. So with that, I want to thank my colleagues for bringing recommendations forward, standing with our allies, protecting our country, both at our southern border and across the world. Mr. Burgess, thank you very much for your time. I yield the remainder. And, and thanks to all of our witnesses. Uh, without objection, the following member statements will be inserted into the record. Uh, Representative Mark Alford. I have no questions for the panel. I yield to Mr. Reschenthaler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Mr. Mass, did you have something that you wanted to add? Careful what you wish for. I can always, I can always add something. Uh, I, sure, I'll add something. I would say this. Um, I've heard many of my Democrat colleagues say about UNRWA that quite literally to quote them, uh, and I think this is public, they would say it again, they cannot defend UNRWA, but we have to continue funding UNRWA. That should not be said about anything relating to the, the spending of the, the dollars of the American people. I can't defend it, but we're going to do it anyway. So thank you for the question. Thanks. And anybody else before I yield back? All right. Yield to the ranking member. Uh, well, uh, thank you all for testifying. I, I don't agree with everything that has been said here today, but I uh, appreciate the fact that you've taken the time to come before the Rules Committee, and uh, with that, I yield back. Thank you. You to the general lady from Minnesota. I would just add thank you very much to the witnesses for uh, taking the time to lay this out. Um, and thank you very much. Thanks. You to the general lady from Pennsylvania. Thank you, Representative Niels. I just wanted to make sure I understood your amendment properly. It is to prevent any humanitarian aid from going to people who are in Palestine or Gaza. When I looked at this bill, I think the bill is titled Israel Security Supplemental Appropriations Act of 2024. And Gaza's word, the word Gaza is used 11 times in 25 pages. I think Israel's used 50-something times. And I said, well, if we're here to support Israel and focus on Israel, why are we focusing on Gaza? If we're going to give $9 billion of the 20, potentially $9 billion or $26 billion to Gaza, well, then let's have a standalone bill and let the House vote on that. But I don't understand how we in the majority okay. are going to confuse Can people Can I just here. redirect you to my question, which was, am I correct? That, that is correct. Purpose? Okay, so it's, you it's, don't want humanitarian aid page to 11, go to people in Gaza. Page 11, line 5, insert for humanitarian needs the following, with okay. respect to Israel. Okay, period. I think, Israel. okay, okay, so That's no it. aid to children who yeah. guess what? Guess what was going to happen? For right, is that correct? Just, hold on, hold on. Migration just one, and one at a time assist, so we can Migration and refugee okay. assistance Reclaiming is Reclaiming my time. We are going to bring Reclaiming Hamas and everybody into our country. We won't vet them like we did in Afghanistan. That's sure. the problem. All right, sure. Thank we, you for clarifying that you don't absolutely. want any aid to go to starving children. I yield back. All right, thanks. Let's just try to go one at a time so we can protect the record. Uh, gentleman from Georgia. Just real quick, Mr. Clyde, at one point they were also denying the export license on bulletproof vests and helmets and other defensive measures. Are they still denying that as well? Uh, are you talking to the state of Israel? Yes. Um, I don't, from my knowledge, I don't think they have approved anything when, with regard to um, small arms or those things associated with small arms um, to the state of Israel. I think it's atrocious. I think it uh, shows that we truly don't support Israel because actions speak louder than words. Uh, and they say one thing and they do something completely different. Uh, so yep. thank you for the question. Nope. Um, my, my point is they're even denying the exporting of uh, bulletproof vests and helmets and other things that are purely defensive in nature. With that, I yield. All right. Thank you. Uh, yield to the gentleman from Colorado. I thank the, uh, the chairman and I thank the witnesses for their testimony and uh, for submitting their amendments. Uh, and I do think some of the amendments, not all certainly, but some of them are serious uh, efforts at legislating, even if I may uh, see them differently. Uh, I do want to just zero in on uh, one point that Mr. Niels made, uh, which is this. I mean, testifying to this committee that because one word appears multiple times in the legislation, and intimating that that is evidence that this bill 
does not support our ally Israel is intellectually dishonest. And if you look, I'll just give you an example, because page 24, section 404, because you took great umbrage, Mr. Niels, it sounds like, of any reference to Gaza in this bill, right? Got it. You think you said 11 times, 10 times, 11 times that it's mentioned. Okay. Section 404, not later than 45 days after the date of enactment of this act, the Secretary of State, in, to, uh, in consultation with the heads of other relevant federal agencies as appropriate, shall brief the appropriate congressional committees in classified form, if necessary, on the status and welfare of hostages being held in Gaza. I think that's an important provision. I suspect you'd agree with me. I hope you'd agree with me that maybe that's a classified briefing that well, members of this body should, should... After what I've seen with this administration and the way they've acted, I can't trust this administration or this government for okay. doing anything okay. properly. Okay, well, again, what I would simply suggest to you, because I, I, this is why I say this, and I appreciate uh, Secretary Zinke's point about those of us serving on the Rules Committee, Republican and Democratic members, it's a serious committee. Many of your colleagues, I think, have made serious attempts to try to amend this legislation. And I'm simply suggesting that coming in and declaring that because a bill references a word uh, 10 times, 11 times, without actually delving into the particular nature of those provisions, in, in this case, a provision actually having to do with ensuring that we are briefed by the relevant intelligence agencies Would on you not getting agree the hostages me, released. Mr. Nails, I'm not asking you a question. I'm making a statement on getting the hostages released. To me, that's important. I suspect that most of our colleagues, including in your caucus, will agree with me. Now, Mr. Zinke, uh, your amendment, and again, this it relates directly to the amendment that Mr. Nails has made. While I disagree with your amendment, you have made the case that on page 11, the provisioning of humanitarian aid, uh, it is not delineated specifically as to where the humanitarian aid is ultimately going. The international disaster assistance in terms of, uh, you know, it, some of it may be apportioned to Sudan, the crisis in Sudan, in Haiti, as well as addressing um, uh, those uh, uh, civilians in Gaza, right? And your point is that you'd like to, I understand your argument, and even though if I disagree with it. That is very different than the argument Mr. Niels has made, which is suggesting that on page 11, even though it does not suggest that all of the provisioning of aid in those two different buckets uh, is going to a particular place, that it somehow is. That's not what the text of the bill says. And so I, your amendments are in direct conflict with each other. Um, I actually, even again, as I said, although I disagree with your amendment, I do think you're making at least a, a, a good faith argument that you believe um, is right, even if I disagree with it. I'll yield back uh, to the chairman. All right. Thank you. I want to yield to the gentleman from Kentucky for any questions he may have. I have no questions. Yield back. All right. Would the gentleman from New York? I, I just uh, like to yield to Mr. Niels if there's any response that you'd like to give. Well, I, I just think when you title, uh, and this was all about an Israel package, aid to Israel. If we're talking about a nine billion dollar number, and you're right, but I heard Meek say it. Meek said it in here. The rancor over foreign affairs that, yeah, this is going to go to Gaza. Now, we ain't saying it's going to Gaza, but it, it, it is because there's no clarification. And all I'm saying is if you can take the $9 billion, just put it, add it to Israel. Now, if you want to put a, a bill out there that says let's give Gaza $9 billion too, well, then get a bill out there and, and produce a bill and let us vote on it. But to throw this $9 billion to go to Gaza, I won't support this, will not support it. And I may even be willing to just say I'm not going to vote for the rule either. I yield back. All right, the gentleman yields back. Uh, so no further questions. Just want to thank the witnesses for their testimony. You're excused. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. All right, all right. We want to keep things moving, so we're going to call up. All right. I don't. All right, we're going to keep things moving. We're going to call up Mr. Bikin, Dr. McCormick, Mr. Ogles. Hey guys, we got to keep moving. All right, we're going to get Mr. Bikin, Dr. McCormick, Mr. Ogles, Chairman Arrington, and then Ms. Kamak. You can come up. Is this the hot seat? 
It is indeed. <laughs> All right, we're going to go to Mr. Bikini. Are you ready? Yeah. All right. Not sure if I got the microphone on. Did I push the right button? Am I on? Red light's on. Okay. All right. Well, I like good news. And uh, some good news is that uh, Epic, uh, former budget director under uh, President 45, uh, has found $90 billion um, that is uh, laying in a, the American Rescue Plan coronavirus state local fiscal recovery fund that $90 billion remains unobligated. And it's interesting that when you look at the um, misuse when last year we suspended the emergency declaration on COVID. That's, that was what this fund was set up for, $350 billion total. And now we have still $90 billion that could be captured. It's uh, interesting what some of this funding is being utilized for if we don't take advantage of, of, of sending it to need versus what I consider waste. 31000 of it was sent to Arizona for art, music, and dance classes serving asylum seekers. Um, that's kind, kind of interesting. Um, so since 2021, it's been abused left and right. Uh, circuses, rodeo, I don't have any problem with rodeo. I just don't know that in a time where we're $34 trillion in debt that we need to be spending money on rodeos. And let me give you one more big glaring uh, misuse of this. The state of Washington spent $340 million through this fund recently to send $1,000 checks to illegal aliens. $340 million total cost. That's 340,000 illegal, undocumented individuals received $1,000 checks that went through this fund, state local recovery, through the American Rescue monies. Um, I think most Americans look at that and say that is pure waste. Um, so, um, Paul Winfrey, um, we, we, my staff visited with him today. He says there's $90 billion that can be captured out of this. That, uh, when you look at all of the funding for Israel, ta Taiwan, and Ukraine, it sets at 96. I think it makes more than enough sense. Um, we'd be wise to stop the abuse of this uh, Biden slush fund and, uh, and start uh, you know, using it for better purposes. Um, so that would pertain to Amendment Number 16 in relation to Taiwan as an offset, Amendment Number 42 in relation to Israel as an offset, and Amendment Number 74 is a pay for uh, for Ukraine. And, Mr. Chairman, I would then want to move towards uh, Amendment Number 77 that, that would like to also uh, obtain support for. That just simply says that uh, as last uh, you know, in the last several months, we've got word there were 14 U.S. Special Forces that were in Ukraine while this administration is assuring people that there were no troops in Ukraine. Uh, Amendment number 77 to H.R. Um, uh, 8035 says that we will get an accounting as to whether or not true, true number of troops, U.S. troops that are in Ukraine. I would encourage support for both and uh, appreciate the time you've given me. Gentleman yields back, Chair. Thanks, gentlemen. Mr. Rogles, you're recognized for your amendments. Um, I want to thank you all for being here. I know this is a laborious process. Mr. Chairman, congratulations. Um, I do have quite a few amendments, uh, 18, but I will hit them very quickly uh, just because out of respect for your time and everyone else's. As it pertains to the uh, Indo-Pacific, uh, number eight strikes the ability to divert foreign military financing funds from the Indo-Pacific to Ukraine because currently there's a provision in there where that money can be moved away from uh, Taiwan to Ukraine. Uh, directs the SECDEF to invite, number nine, directs the SECDEF to invite Taiwan to the 2024 Rim of the Pacific Naval Exercises. Uh, number 10, prohibits the use of funds to create, procure, or display any map that inaccurately, inaccurately depicts the occupied country of Tibet as part of the public, uh, People's Republic of China. Uh, and then obviously, uh, we're pushing back against, uh, you know, the, the Chinese aggression uh, in the region, which is important. Uh, number 11 prohibits the use of funds for Qatar made available to major non-NATO allies in this bill in consequence of the Qatari government's failure to release additional hostages and for its role in subsidizing the murder of 1,200 Israelis. Number 18 uh, prohibits, uh, pro prohibits EB-5 visas to Chinese nationals. They're currently being abused by Chinese investors to shortcut and get citizenship in our country. 
And then number 17 calls for the full diplomatic relations uh, with Taiwan. As we jump to Israel, uh, number eight provides the use of funds to be made available uh, for Israel to obtain the F-22 in defense of its uh, sovereignty and its borders. Uh, number 32 defunds the OB amendment uh, that prohibits the transfer of the F-22 to any foreign country that dates back to the Department of Defense Appropriations Act of 1998. We're in extreme circumstances today, and our ally Israel needs to be able to defend itself. Uh, number nine, eliminating funding for the Office of Palestinian Affairs. Number 10, prohibits, prohibits the use of funds in this bill from going to, uh, going to maintain Qatar's major non-NATO ally status. Uh, and again, you know, I understand that Qatar uh, claims uh, neutrality, but we all know that uh, they tend to play on both sides of the fence. And I personally believe they have a responsibility and culpability of what happened on October 7th. Uh, number 20 prohibits any funds from being made available to the Palestinian Liberation Organization, the Palestinian Authority, or any Palestinian administered areas within Ju Judea, Samaria, or the Gaza Strip. 49 prohibits the use of funds from being used in contravention of Israel's administration of the Judea and Samaria areas. Number 51 prohibits the use of funds for the Special Representative for Palestinian Affairs. This is an unnecessary position and a position made by the Biden administration to further his agenda of a Palestinian state. Number 52 enables funds to be used to approve the sale or license of Moabs uh, to Israel. Jumping to Ukraine, and I'm almost done. Thank you for your indulgence, Mr. Chairman. Uh, number two, prohibits the use of funds to arm, train, or otherwise assist the neo-Nazi Azov Battalion, its successor, third separate assault brigade, or any other successor organizations. Um, I think we can all agree that what happened on October 7th was uh, an atrocity. It was an act of war. And I do have concerns that the aid package to Ukraine is, in essence, propping up neo-Nazis in Europe, that in the event that there is some sort of solution or path forward, they may end up or find themselves having a role in the Ukrainian government. And again, we, we end up, we're going to have to deal with that on the long term. But uh, number three prohibits uh, funds to provide arms, training, or other assistance to the Russian Volunteer Corps. Uh, number four prohibits the president from unilaterally canceling Ukraine's debts. If it's a loan, let's keep it alone, and then that could be used uh, later by Congress uh, as some sort of bargaining uh, or reckoning uh, as it pertains to the Ukrainian government. And then finally, Mr. Chairman, number 73 prohibits the use of funds to provide targeting assistance to Ukraine. With that, Mr. Chairman, again, I thank you for your indulgence, and I yield back. Chair, thanks the gentleman. The gentleman from Georgia, Dr. McCormick, is recognized. Thank you, Dr. Chair. Chairman Burgess, Ranking Member McGovern, distinguished members of the committee, thank you for allowing me to testify my amendment to H.R. 8035, the Ukraine Security Supplemental Appropriations Act. Although I have submitted a handful of amendments to the bills before the Rules Committee today, I want to focus on my amendment to the Ukraine Supplemental Aid Bill. I am a strong supporter of assistance to Ukraine in their fight against Russia's illegal an unprovoked invasion. For Ukraine to win this war, 100% of the aid we provide must reach its intended destination and serve its intended purpose. Moreover, we have an obligation to the American people to demonstrate the integrity of our assistance to Ukraine. Failure to do so could cause the American people to possibly lose confidence in these efforts, which would only benefit Vladimir Putin. We owe it to the American taxpayer and to our Ukrainian partners to exert strict oversight on the aid to ensure we spend American taxpayer dollars responsibly. Currently, the Inspector General for the Department of Defense, Department of State, and USAID coordinates to conduct this vital oversight, but they need more help. My amendment, based on the Ukraine Aid Oversight Act that I introduced last year, would give the three OIGs the specific hiring authority that they need to execute their oversight missions. Under current law, inspector generals can only obtain this flexible hiring authority if the United States is in an active state of war. We need to get them this authority now and without delay. In closing, my amendment will improve oversight of U.S. assistance to Ukraine without creating more bureaucracy or even more government. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Ranking Member, and the members of the committee for your time, I humbly request your support to make this amendment in order. 
with that, I yield. Sure, thanks, the gentleman. The gentleman yields back. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Chairman of the Budget Committee, Mr. Arrington, for his amendments. The great state of Texas, Mr. Chairman. I hope that as a fellow Texan and a member of the Budget Committee, maybe I'll have more favorable, favorable consideration for this common sense amendment to pay for the things that we think are important and are priorities for our country. Um, let me say a policy-making process that gives no consideration for paying for things is not only irresponsible, it's irrational. And, and this irrational process by which we make decisions on behalf of the American people to create more government without paying for it, I should say by thrusting the cost on the backs of our children rather than taking either money out of the pockets of our citizens right here, right now, or cutting some program or some part of the government right here, right now, uh, is the root cause of our reckless spending and our unsustainable debt, period. Full stop. If we forced, let's say, if we were forced by a balanced budget amendment or some mechanism to have to consider the cost, I suspect, Mr. Chairman, we'd have half the government we have today. We'd have more freedom, more local and state decision making instead of everything being decided here, and we'd have a brighter future for our children. But here we are. So can we decide together? Can we make a pact? as Americans concerned about the future and with the context of a $34 trillion debt and climbing, the highest level of indebtedness surpassing World War II and we're in relative peace and prosperity, a nation who that will add t uh, $20 trillion in additional debt over the next 10 years and a country paying 62 cents on every dollar just to service the, the, the interest on the debt. To suggest uh, our fiscal health is in decline is an understatement. To suggest that our balance sheet is upside down and the unfunded liabilities of $140 trillion over the next 30 years is not a threat, not only to our economy and our security, but America's leadership in the world and, yes, I think the biggest threat to the future of America and my children's future in this country. So with that wind up, let me suggest to those who believe that these, uh, this security package is in the best interest of the American people, that we should also consider that peace through strength is not only about military prowess and a foreign policy posture, it's about the strength of our balance sheet. It's about fiscal and economic strength, which is the underpinnings of all this. We don't get to make these decisions if we bankrupt the country or have a sovereign debt crisis. Um, I don't think we've ever been in such a tenable situation. And I'm here to sound the alarm and I'm here to appeal to the, to the morality of our great leaders on this rules committee. Pay for it. And I got one right here, bipartisan a provision that's been offered uh, under the Obama administration in President Obama's budget and is, in fact, in the budget that we passed out of committee most recently, the reverse the cursed GOP fiscal framework for saving this country and putting it on a path to balance. And it's site-neutral payments. Mr. Chairman, you know this better than anybody else, but what's happening today, Democrat friends and Republican uh, colleagues, is that we're paying hospitals more to provide the same service with the same outcome, with the same equipment, often the same physicians and mid-levels for outpatient procedures that we pay less to independent physicians. That's $150 billion in savings, Mr. Norman. It seems pretty straightforward that we could offer up something that not only, not only would pay for this entire security package and put a down payment of 50 billion dollars to reduce the deficit that is exploding but would also address our broken health care system it would it would reverse the consolidation of doctors aligning with hospitals we get less choice as patients seniors pay more money through deductibles and premiums this is a winner winner chicken dinner as we say back in Lubbock America and I just can't imagine why this bright, 
august group of, 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 of proud Americans would not accept this in good faith and in order as an amendment. And that's my proposal, uh, Mr. Chairman. And, Mr. Chairman, lastly, um, Alex Azar and Kathleen Sebelius, two former secretaries of Health and Human Services here for our great country, from different administrations, one from Trump, one from Obama, wrote an op-ed just today about this very issue supporting site-neutral payments uh, as a health care reform. With that, I thank you for your generous time, and I implore you to consider uh, accepting this amendment. At, at the risk of my own self-aggrandizement, uh, that op-ed came about after I seriously queried the current Secretary of Health and Human Services yesterday in our in his part of our budget hearing in energy and commerce. So maybe we're on the road to something, but we'll see. The gentlelady from Florida is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all my colleagues for going through all of these. <laughs> I know it is um, a tremendous amount of work, and we have some serious decisions ahead of us, so I appreciate uh, everyone's consideration. I am going to keep it short and simple. I have one amendment to offer here today. <laughs> you know, keeping it simple. We all obviously all agree that this is a, a pretty substantial package, um, $95 billion being considered in foreign assistance. And over the past few years, since Russians, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the United States has contributed more than $67 billion to Ukraine in its fight against, against Russia. Far more than that, actually. Now, I know that there's been a lengthy discussion about the type of aid. And while, by and large, there is agreement on defense-related aid, uh, there is one area that I think deserves far more consideration um, and scrutiny. My amendment, amendment number 14, would simply strike the bilateral economic assistance account in this bill. Americans, every single one of us, have constituents back home that are trying to make decisions between gas and groceries. We are seeing reports where our Treasury Department is having an issue placing bonds. We are having challenges here at home that Americans quite simply can't afford to bear the brunt of those on top of that of a nation abroad. So, in the interest of keeping it short and sweet, I want to thank my colleagues, who I think represent a, a pretty diverse cross-section of the conference, Congresswoman Bice, Congressman Alford, Congressman Bean, and Congressman Donalds, for supporting me in this amendment. I think this is a common-sense approach to paring this effort down. So with that, I hope and encourage my colleagues to support my amendment to strike economic aid under this package. Thank you. I yield. Sure. Thanks, gentlelady. Gentlelady yields back. The gentleman from Arizona is recognized. Yeah, thank you very much. Sorry, I'm not going to be as brief as she is. I have five. So this is Gosar Amendment 45, Gosar Amendment 64, Gosar Amendment 65, and then 103 and 102. We'll start with uh, 45. Uh, this is a reform that basically, uh, in the funding reform, uh, it, des it describes what it actually forms a statutory uh, order against the contingency fund and, and the operations uh, approximals. And until it estab we establish a statutory definition for emergency war funding. As most of you know, I'm fanatic about this, about this emergency aspect because of the budgetary complications it has for us. And really, it has not been part of our formal budgetary process. So until we can get that, no, no money would be sent. Gosar 46 is uh, no funding for the Ukraine until we get all the, uh, until the president has initiated peace talks in the area. Uh, and I think this is just something that um, most of us believe that uh, that war in Ukraine is not going well. I've seen, we've seen a lot of the Ukrainian people lose their lives, particularly young people. I'm done with this. I'm tired with this. And I think we ought to be initiating that peace process. When I asked Ukraine what victory looked like, they said they need to get out of the land back in Crimea. Folks, Crimea is never going to go back. Crimea has, has taken that, that option to be part of Russia in most cases. 
So I think there's very little deliberation in that. Uh, sorry, I'm a little disruffled here because um, GOSAR 102 uh, prevents funding for any of the concealment or classification of the records regarding Nord Stream pipeline explosions. It's probably one of the largest environmental impacts, particularly in the ocean that we've seen. And I think that we've got to have this so that we can understand the ramifications before we do stuff like this, because unfortunately, the, the finger is pointing at us for being involved in this. Uh, it goes to 103, prohibits any of the funding from being utilized to conceal or classify the information on Gonzalo Lira. This is an American citizen and a journalist who printed only stuff that uh, the, the Ukrainian government did not like. He was imprisoned, he was tortured, and he died. Something's wrong with that story, particularly as an American. Uh, this 64 basically states that none of the funds made available by this act may be used to facilitate the use of military force against Iran, including any deployments of forward uh, operations bases in Iraq and Syria, absent expression, expressed uh, authorization by Congress. So without Congress's consent, we can't move that, that past aspect forward. I think this is constitutionally very uh, adept, and we want to make sure that we have Congress going along with this. So, because war is ugly, and, and it should be done fast. It should be very uh, uh, surgical-like, but Congress has to be part of that discussion. So with that, I think I, we ought to make all these in, in order. Uh, so I appreciate your conversation. Thank you. Take care. And the General, does the gentleman yield back? With that? Do you yield, yield back? back, yeah. And I think uh, Mr. Norman, uh, did you seek time on your amendments? Mr. Chairman, let me, um, I think Kat had my one amendment eliminating economic support. I offer up uh, amendment number 40, which basically eliminates the president's ability to waive cost-sharing requirement. Um, and I think we had discussed about that earlier. And then number 34, the, un the strikes ability of the president to cancel indebtedness incurred by Ukraine. Um, with that, I yield back. I want to thank all of our witnesses for presenting their amendments. I have no questions, so I'll go to the gentleman from Massachusetts. Thank you for being here. I, I don't agree with everything everybody has said, but uh, I won't be labored by asking questions, so I'll yield back. Chair, thanks the gentleman. Gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Kentucky. I have no questions. The gentleman from Colorado. The gentleman from South Carolina. Again, I want to thank this panel for spending so much time with us and for your thoughtful amendments. Chairman Arrington, I do want to thank you for, for bringing up uh, the fact that Secretary Azar and Secretary Sebelius agreed with me when I questioned Secretary Becerra yesterday. Again, maybe we can, maybe it's the start of something. So thank you. This, this panel is excused.